Good evening. Uh, it's February 11th, 2019. Um, tonight, the Board of Selectmen's meeting. Uh, all members are present. Uh, we had uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, the board met for an executive session. Uh, the motion did fail, and the Board of Selectmen will uh, be taking no further action. Uh, would you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we begin with uh, transmitting of uh, Treasury Warrants 30, 30A, 31, and 31A. Uh, is there a motion? So There's a motion by Mr. Loud. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. McCoy. Any discussion? All in favor? And that's unanimous. Uh, before we get into our appointments, uh, I know that there's probably been a lot of discussion around the Restucia Rink. Uh, it's not on the agenda, but we will uh, discuss it under new business. Uh, we'll do it under new business, so that way there we avoid any uh, violation of the open meeting law. Uh, our first appointment uh, this evening is with uh, Tina Stewart, the library director, uh, to go over the strategic plan for uh, 2021 to 2025. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, the town manager asked me to um, give you an update on the strategic plan which we have undertaken for the 21-25. Uh, well, every four years, the library develops the five-year uh, strategic plan. And the time frame of our current plan is FY16 to FY20. So now we've begun to do the next plan for the next five years. Um, it's due at the Board of Library Commissioners on October 1st, 2019. Um, having a plan uh, on file with the Board of Library Commissioners qualifies us to apply for certain grants, including construction grants and certain federal grants. But more important, the strategic planning process is a valuable tool for evaluating library services and ensuring that our library gives the greatest possible benefit to residents. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of the uh, uh, planning process steps. In the fall, we hired a planning consultant, Barbara Leverus, uh, Barbara is a Wilmington resident. She helped us uh, with our two, uh, in 2014 to develop our current plan. And since then, she has been helping some other libraries in the area. She assisted uh, Burlington and Newberry uh, Public Libraries. And she recently also worked with WCTV on assisting them in developing their strategic plan. Uh, a strategic planning advisory committee was formed. And this includes representatives from town government, local organizations, schools, parents, the business community, library trustees, friends of the library, and library staff. So our current planning committee includes uh, Charlotte Wood, our assistant library director, Sheila Burke, she is a Wilmington uh, school teacher, Wilmington Public Schools, Paul Shalifor from the Wilmington Police Department, Michelle Chamberlain, a uh, member of one of our book discussion groups and a member of the Friends of the Library Executive Board, Mike Shampoo, former Board of Selectmen member and a businessman, Jonathan Eaton, a current uh, member of the Board of Selectmen and also a former Finance Committee member and also he's very involved in Wilmington Rotary, Jeff Higgs, uh, who was very active in one of our writing groups at the library, Michelle Kincaid, a member of the Town Finance Committee, Nancy Curran, she is a member of one of our, our needleworkers group that meet every Friday at the library and she's also a, a retiree. Uh, Becky McGrath from We're One Wilmington, Jeff Nussbaum, Chairman of the Board of Library Trustees, Barbara Robb, our Youth Services Librarian, and David Ragsdale um, from the School Committee. So I think it's a well-represented uh, committee that uh, represents uh, different constituencies. They met on, uh, our first meeting was January 29th. Their charge is to provide feedback, advice, and, and to support the plan. An important part of the process of the strategic plan is to do an internal and an external sort of assessment of the library. So the internal assessment uh, we've already undertaken. Barbara has met with the library staff, and uh, she's meeting with the uh, uh, trustees and friends of the library next week. And in doing so, we do these exercises where we identify our strengths, our challenges, and our opportunities. 
Uh, we're also going to be doing uh, two focus groups. Uh, one was with the Community Re Resources Roundtable, which was scheduled for tomorrow, but I'm not sure about that with the weather. Uh, and the, our Community Resources Roundtable is a group of representatives from local nonprofit organizations. We'll also be doing a focus group with our library ambassadors. Uh, the library ambassadors are our power users, so to speak, and they are uh, our library advocates. And for the past three years, we've been meeting once a year. We update them on the library, and they help us spread uh, the good word about the library into the community. So we'll be doing a focus group with, with them. We'll also be doing a town-wide community survey, which will be posted on the website in early March. And I'd like to encourage all Wilmington residents to complete the survey, whether you use the library or don't would like to hear from you. Really appreciate your input, and we really do need everyone's input to really develop a very effective plan. Um, so then we'll present all the data that we collect to the uh, uh, Strategic Planning Advisory Committee. Subsequently, then we'll draft some goals and objectives, complete the draft of the plan, submit it to the uh, Advisory Committee, and then, uh, then to the Board of Library Trustees for their approval, and then to the Board of Library Commissioners uh, in late September, so it's uh, in there on their uh, in, in with them on uh, by October 1st and then subsequently we also do an annual action plan every year that's based on the strategic plan so it's sort of a to-do list every year focusing on what the goals and objectives are and how we're going to achieve those each year um, I have a copy of the planning process of, and I could just pass just everyone if you just take it kind of summarizes what I just kind of what I just went over um, so that's really it, but I'll just leave you with a, uh, a quote from Sun Tzu, uh, the famous Chinese general and philosopher who I think believed in strategic planning. He said, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory, and tactics without strategy is noise before de defeat. So I think planning uh, is a good idea, and I think sort of served, uh, has served us well. I told Jeff this is really this is my sixth long-range plan since I've been library director. And it really, I think, has been a useful tool in guiding us and developing uh, the services that are best for the community. Right. Thank you. It's a, it's a great uh, presentation. I, I enjoyed going through the, um, the information the that packet. you, that you gave us. The resource packet was an orientation, uh, a sort of an overview of the demographics of the town and uh, what we've achieved to date in, under the current plan to give a, sort of an orientation to our committee. Yeah, it, it was particularly enlightening on, on the last page where it gave a, a comparison with Weather other library. towns and yes. how our expenditures are the, the lowest, but you, our programs are the highest. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, it bodes well for uh, what your, you and your staff okay. do over there. Oh, We're also just the smallest building. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> you noticed that as well. Yes. So hopefully that yes. will expand a little bit. Uh, but I noticed that that expansion may not occur because not of the a pricing. While. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there any questions? Other, um, I call, yes, Mr. Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Stewart. Thanks so much for your presentation and, and for being here. As always, I want to thank you and uh, the members of your committee, uh, as well as Mr. Eaton, uh, for the work you're doing and that you continue to do and to uh, continue to make sure that the library is such a great resource for the community. Much like the Senior Center, I feel like you have something to offer for a lot of folks and uh, always kind of come up with unique ideas mm -hmm. uh, to uh, have better offerings. So I really appreciate that and wish you well and, and uh, thanks for being here. So just to echo my colleague, I'm sure we're going to go right down the road. You guys do a fantastic job. You've been at that home for such a long time. Tim, you do a great job and you're as good as your employees and you have wonderful staff. And I think uh, the town gets a great bang for the buck for the services they get relative to the library and they offer great services for our young kids and our seniors as well. Thank you. Is this, is this report um, going to be on the, the website or it's on your website? I no, it's right now it, it's just a, uh, we've just distributed first to the uh, Strategic Planning Committee and to you, the Board of Selectmen, um, to the trustees. I haven't, uh, it hasn't gone out on the website yet. We could probably attach it, the, the ultimate, the plan will be on the website when we're complete and we could probably put that as, as an, yeah, an addendum. Yeah. Very uh, yeah. informative, you know, the, the Wilmington profile and, mm -hmm. and all of the work that you've done throughout the, the year and, and all of the created programs that you have. So just, just great uh, report, uh, Mr. Reed. Uh, real quickly, um, I was really, um, I had a great time five years ago serving mm -hmm. on this committee and I was really excited to do it again. Um, 
something in, in um, the, the community and library profile. Uh, you took the six priorities that we wanted the library to focus on in 2014 and you kind of organized it by subject to show like this is one of the goals that we wanted you guys to be addressing and working towards and these are the, the initiatives that we took to help achieve that. Uh, so it was really good to see on on the back end to yeah. see uh, this wasn't just kind of a going through the motions exercise it was this is what we think of when we think of this is where we currently are and this is where we want to be and the steps that you and your staff have taken uh, to do it the the your events pamphlet yeah. it has our library has something for everybody yeah. in town it doesn't matter what your age what your interest what your reading interest level or, le or ability is there are so many different things that are at our library I think you guys uh, you probably interact with more residents um, than a lot of the other departments, and I think you do a great job representing our town. So um, I, I don't have enough good things to say about you guys. You guys do a great job. I, I've said it before. I think you're thought leaders in our community. Um, so keep up the good work, and uh, <laughs> looking forward to see where we go. Well, and thank you for uh, uh, volunteering to be on the committee again. It's great to have you. It's already been said, but I agree with Mr. Eaton. Um, you guys do have something for everyone in town, not just seniors or not just students, but every age student, every age young adult. And I think it's awesome and uh, keep up the good work for you and your staff. Uh, thank you for representing Wilmington Great. Thank you. Hey, thanks hope for your time. This next plan will also be, uh, yep. uh, be able to continue to do what the community needs from the library. Thank you for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Holt, do you have uh, to add? Just, uh, another example of uh, the library's attention to uh, the environment, the ever-changing environment that libraries across the country are, are uh, in the midst of. And this is really one of the tools that has been used consistently over the years uh, to uh, give the library some sense of uh, how they should evolve. And, and Tina and her staff have done a masterful job at uh, being able to change up their programs, change up their services, and I think it shows uh, with the uh, the level of activity that continues to go on there. And I just want to thank you, Jeff, and the town administration, and the town finance committee, and the board of selectmen for its continued support for the library. So that is uh, very important. And thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're about uh, three minutes ahead of schedule for our next appointment, and that is with uh, Terry Masiello, uh, the Elder Services Director, to give us an update on the programs, including the Memory Cafe. Yes. Um, you know, at the same time, in just an entering of speaking about Tina and her department, we work closely with their department, and they are. They're just, it's a, it's a great department to work with, and, um, I'm happy we have them. Um, yes, I'm here. Terry Marciello, Director of Elderly Services for the Department of Elderly Services. Thank you so much for having me here today and following up about the Memory Cafe. Um, we started that. The actual starting date was in October, October 24th. So we've been doing it for um, several months now. And when we took this project on, we knew exactly what we wanted to do, but we weren't sure as to, um, you know, how it was going to develop. And, you know, sometimes when you have a big project, you're like, oh, you know, we want this, this, and this. And actually things are happening. Um, we are extremely fortunate with um, the support from, um, not all, of, of course, not only yourselves in the town, uh, but also WOW and um, assisting hands and financially supporting us, being a sponsor for it. Um, and we're very lucky and happy to have them. Uh, let me kind of give you an idea when I say Memory Cafe, and um, our Memory Cafe is called Our Moment. The point of it is to have it once a month for caregivers and the person that they're caring for can come to an environment and feel safe, um, feel relaxed, and not have to worry if anyone having a hard day um, and being able to be in an activity. When you come into, we are very fortunate we get to use the 4th of July building, um, not only because um, it's, it's, it's put aside, it's separate, it's small, um, it's our own location, there's nothing to disturb anybody, uh, but also it has made, we're finding that it's made in the, 
um, the people that are the participants also feel um, when they see that they think it's theirs now <laughs> um, so it's it's very you know I think it works out wonderful when you walk into the room um, it's not seen as the the building that you've been in when you first walk in uh, we've made sure that there's aroma uh, therapy whether it be um, tend to be with the lavender smell lavender tends to calm people down we also have uh, music playing in the background and depending upon the day the lighting we make sure that the lighting is good um, the activity one of the first activities we did was did pumpkins others did we had this program last month called power flower it's a, um, a group that gets together and they collect flowers that are otherwise going to be thrown away and they do want to make it into other projects and they came in with us and did a wonderful um, group project. Um, what we find too is that people are feeling relaxed. They start singing out loud. They start reminiscing. Um, caregivers are able to share uh, in different resources or a way to relax or just sharing in general. Um, this would not be possible without Laura Pickett, my case manager, but also um, Lori Hayes. Um, she actually is a person that's very <coughs> active in the town in several ways and she's actually um, a nurse and so she's also there with that medical twist on it too in case there should be an emergency um, and the other person that has tend to be a wonderful asset to us is officer Paul Shalafor um, we have gotten to know him very very well now he comes to every program he the first the goal for him to being active with us was to making sure that the parking you know making sure there was parking available for everyone coming in well, then he came in the first time, and now people look forward to having him come. Um, he adds, he does the projects with us. He makes, if there's a lull, he, he's very entertaining. He's a very entertaining gentleman. Um, but he has a warm heart. He's uh, extremely genuine. Um, so he actually is um, an active piece now with us. Uh, and again, it was teamwork. The whole thing is teamwork. Um, and we've had uh, roughly... Um, around 16 uh, people that have come, 16 to 18 people. Uh, that's actually a really good number, and it's a consistent <coughs> number. Um, and what was nice last time was we had someone that was actually out of town that came, which is wonderful. And the reason I say that is that means the word is getting around that we have a program. Um, so we're very pleased with it. Um, we will be continuing um, every third Wednesday of the month. Uh, and at the same time, what we're seeing is our care. We also have, Laura runs a monthly caregivers group, a support group. Um, that is also, um, that's the third uh, Monday um, of every month. And we're finding that people are starting to open up, um, coming into that, asking questions about that. So it's kind of working hand in hand, and it's, a, it's really working out great. But again, this wouldn't happen if we didn't have the support from yourselves in the community. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for making this a positive program. Um, a couple of the other programs that I did want to mention um, is a, another de department that we're working with is um, the I mean, sorry, the police department. Samantha Reef and uh, Lieutenant uh, Desmond are actually they went to a program um, for a training, as you probably already know, for mental health. Um, and Samantha and I keep, you know, we uh, have bumped into each other on several occasions on different cases within the town um, and realizing that mental health is um, obviously a, a strong concern for many. Um, but as to, it would be great for the training that they were doing for others to incorporate in with um, the senior population. Why is that? Well, giving it a better, um, not to everyone being timid and talking about it and have a better understanding of mental health it's a four um a four day workshop so it's, we're doing it actually once a month we started it last month um in fact we're having it here at the town hall um due to space uh, we're, we're actually having here at the town hall on tomorrow um and that's another great program because it's also uh the seniors that are involved in that seeing the different realm of um the police department and supporting the community so, um, and Samantha has just been wonderful, a wonderful um, addition to helping our department and working together as a team. Um, 
So just as a, a brief thing, we also are having our, our, our free income tax program um, that started uh, the 5th, February 5th. Uh, it will be running every Tuesday. That's going to be at the Senior Center. Um, the big push, obviously, uh, that what, what we try to do uh, when people do come for our free in tax, income tax program is um, going for that circuit breaker, which I, is a, a little over $1,000 that people can get um, in the, within their taxes. It's a, a formula that they come together with your water bill, your property tax, and your income. Um, and it's run, actually, it's a state program, Massachusetts <coughs> program. Um, so we really try to get people to be more aware of that. And actually, it's great because people, that's the first thing they ask is, am I going to get my circuit breaker? Um, so, but the education still needs to go out there for people to realize not to be afraid to do your Massachusetts um, state income tax, uh, that that could be very beneficial for you, even though you're told, um, you know, you don't make enough, your income isn't enough, you really don't need to do your income tax. Well, it's actually beneficial for you to do it if you have a, a private home especially. Um, so those are the few things that are going on right now. I just wanted to, to kind of give you, give you an update and thank you for letting me come in. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, any questions? Mr. Bendel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Terry, for being here. Yes. Another great presentation and obviously another fine example of the uh, variety of programs that you offer for residents. Really appreciate that. Just like I mentioned earlier, just like the library, always coming up with creative ways to, uh, to uh, appeal to the, uh, to the residents in town. And I know you guys are literally bursting at the seams over there, and so I'm glad to see that there's uh, some money, money in this year's budget to do some improvements over there. And yes. I know when I visited with you guys last, uh, you were kind enough to show us uh, where those improvements are going to be. So I look forward to that and the central artery of the, the building there. But uh, this, is, uh, this is great. Really thank you and your staff and wish you well. And, uh, and uh, hope this will be another great offering for the residents here in town. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Terry, once again, I've been saying it for years, you do an outstanding job as the director, and obviously the folks that work for you do a great job. A lot of services go into that department. It's really wonderful that the town really takes initiative at town meeting. Everyone supports the budget, especially it means a lot for the seniors when they can get on that bus, take them to do a little shopping, take them to the Leahy Clinic, Winchester Hospital, doctor visits. It means a lot. You also have programs where they can help an accountant comes in, helps them with the accounting and Zumba and all those wonderful things. Yes. Question, how old do you have to be to join the club? 60. 60? Geez, I could go there tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, you know. You well, know, more than you welcome know, to no, take Thank you. You know, so just showing my age a little bit. But, you no, know, once again, it's a great program. They do fantastic work and a bunch of lovely, lovely seniors up there. I always have a great time when I go up there. And mm -hmm. this Thursday, you got to wait a little while. Uh, Yes, Valentine's Thursday, Day, we chicken do have pie. Have a Valentine's Day celebration. That's right too. Thank you for bringing that up. I All can't right. believe it's Valentine's. We're mm. talking about that. All right, but good. yes, it's going to be an event at noontime. Um, Harold's pot pie. So you feel free to pop in. It's the best. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eaton. Just uh, more great work. This is. I remember back when I was on the finance committee, having you, Tina Stewart, and uh, Karen Campbell come in on the same day. It was like, just. How many great things that that uh, that all three departments do, but you guys, you and your department do a lot. I know that you've increased your, the number of programs that you have, uh, and you are bursting at the seams. But I think uh, you guys are a, a huge value add to our community. So great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight and giving getting us an update. And it's already been said, but all the different great programs that you provide for our seniors is phenomenal and it's just another great resource for this town so thank you for all, you and your staff and all the hard work that you all do thank you thank you thank you very very much and thank you so much for all your support we really really appreciate it um, again uh, you know Tina uh, Terry does a great job with um, all the programs clearly the uh, senior population as uh, Terry has said oftentimes is a a growing population and uh, by was it 2020 it'll be over 6,000 uh, residents in town who will uh, be in that category of 60 or over and so uh, you know as uh, we've talked about in the past with our facilities plan uh, this is going to be an issue that we'll be looking to deal with from a facility standpoint in the meantime uh, Tina's done a I'm sorry Terry has done a great job okay. with uh, uh, with the programs that really you know, it's great to have a building, but you've got to have the programs uh, that bring people together, and, and Terry has done that. 
Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank to, you. To you, your staff, and all the volunteers. Just a wonderful job that you do for the residents of, uh, of Wilmington. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Okay, we are a bit ahead of schedule uh, by about five minutes. Um, so we'll go to the 7.30. I don't see why we can't move down to the 7.30 uh, discussion on a consideration for change in uh, annual town meeting date. Mr. Uh, this was uh, a request uh, um, by uh, Selectman McCoy to uh, bring forward a discussion about uh, consideration of uh, changing the annual town meeting <coughs> a date. This has been uh, previously talked about, uh, and uh, I guess there's a, a number of different options, clearly, uh, whether it uh, be uh, on certain days of the week as opposed to a Saturday or earlier uh, in the year. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the background, if you will, and so I think it's really a conversation that the um, board should have if, if the board is uh, looking to uh, make a change. It is uh, a requirement that uh, we would receive town meeting approval uh, and then um, require an act of the legislature. Mr. McCoy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I can just uh, um, make a couple of uh, inquiries and talk about this. I see uh, former Chairman uh, Shampoo in the audience and he recommended that I be on the bylaw committee and I did, I was happy to do that. And on the bylaw committee, we took a look at our bylaws to make adjustments. We're in the people business and we really wanna try to get, you know, the residents to come to vote, to come to a town meeting. So we kicked that, uh, kicked that around. It was a unanimous vote to look at options to change the annual town meeting, hopefully sometime in March. And, and the town manager did do some research. So at one time, from what it said, 1957 to 1979, it was the, uh, in March, the first Saturday was the election in March of the town elections, and the second Saturday was the town meeting. And I respect the fact that the town manager has to prepare his budget, we all get that. So I think the bottom line is that what the consensus was to maybe change the town meeting. Obviously, if we change the town meeting, we, and I'll admit, we never talked about changing the town election. I assume that you'd have to entertain that as well. So it'd be up to the board if they wanted to do that. Maybe this is something to think about for next year. Maybe that's the case. I put that forward now for at least to have a discussion on that. I mean, I think the bottom line is we always say we want to get people involved, and a lot of times folks will call up and say, how come that went in? I was notified, well, we had a town meeting, and people talked about you know, making town meeting or not, for example, I believe at this annual town meeting, just like last year, it's Holy Communion. So a lot of folks can't make that. I spent a lot of time, and I gotta give a shout out to Mr. Ruggiero. I called and talked to him in detail about this, because I did want to talk about it. And he, he was very helpful. And the bottom line is they can accommodate certain things. And I was thinking of, well, the manager does have to prepare the budget. I wasn't looking to do what we did back in uh, the early 1950s, to 1979, say the first Saturday and the second Saturday of March. So I said, Why don't, how about if there's a suggestion about having maybe, say, the first Saturday in April and the last Saturday in March, you know, utilizing, you know, obviously the first uh, Saturday in April would be for the annual town meeting. And he said that we could probably accommodate certain things, and obviously sports was an issue, but we could accommodate it. But then he called me back, and I guess he talked to the music department. And I guess the first Saturday in April, they have like the, the Pops concert, which is really huge, and it spends a lot of time for them preparing. And then the, and then the other one, I believe, was the, uh, he mentioned it was the, uh, The, yeah, the acapella group, they said they could probably change that from another time, but they said the, the Pops concert is so popular, it's a lot of work, and I wouldn't want to disrupt that with the folks. So I just kicked this around to the board uh, to see if they would be interested in maybe changing a town meeting. I want to hear from the manager. Like I said, I understand he has to do the budget, but like I said, uh, you know, we're in this business. It's like the residents are like customers. We want to service them. And to get people, we, we always talk about trying to get people to meetings. Why not give them an opportunity and try it? I think the survey we did was, I think it was mixed. 50% said we should have it maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, 7 to 11, or a Saturday in, in March. I think that's what we should probably take a look at, whatever the pleasure of the board is. 
you know, maybe we should maybe try to put something at this town meeting, if you think it's it warrants it, and that way it would be up for next next year. You know, so I'm just kicking that around to maybe make a change. That's all. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Reed. Um, just a, a point of clarification, Mr. McCoy. Is that bylaw review committee? Is that still meeting, or is that wrapped up? We start meeting. It's pretty much wrapped up. But we did discuss this, and I want to touch base real quick on something. I did talk to Mr. Ruggiero. What I'm what I would like to see is if we could. Uh, it would be, from what I understand, maybe the last Saturday in March we will look at annual town meeting, and then the third Saturday in March would be a town election because historically you've always had the election first then the town meeting. And I'll admit, we never talked about the election in the bylaw committee. We talked about maybe changing you know, the uh, possibility yeah. of town meeting, only to get people to get involved, plain and simple. Yeah. And uh, I, I'd offer that. I mean, the dates would be... I wrote it down here somewhere real quick. I brought this here. I mean, the dates for 2020, if that we did that, it would be the uh, last March, the last Saturday of March would be March 28th. That would be the town meeting. And then on March 21st, that would be, say, the town election. If we decided to go that route, I mean, obviously, we went in the opposite direction because they did make the change to have it the last week in April was for the election and the first Saturday in May. I thought if we went backwards, and I understand April 15th in that area of time is usually spring uh, vacation, so I didn't want to disrupt that. So I figured just go back that one week, but obviously the, uh, the you have the pops. So that's something that I thought we'd talk about. That's all. So one, one issue that I, I would hope that however this is resolved is that we don't have the uh, election after annual town meeting because what I want to try and preserve is I don't want annual town meeting to turn into a campaign stop because no. um, I, I, I'm not saying that anybody up here or anybody else would be doing that, but I think it, it lends itself to um, campaigning during an annual town meeting, and I don't think that, that would be appropriate. Um, I, I'm glad that the town last fall did put out the survey. Uh, I wished that we had 479 people respond. I wished it was more, but I think that's kind of the underlying theme mm -hmm. here because I think the goal would be that we have more participation at annual town meeting. More people show up, more people are engaged in the process and make decisions uh, for how uh, their town government works. Uh, a lot of the um, preferences for whether it's a Saturday or whether it's during the week or what week it's going to be, a lot of people actually skipped that. So again, 479 people did respond for the what weekday works best, so you're really just picking Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You had 110 people that just didn't answer that question, and there's no why. Uh, for the Saturdays that worked best, you had 216 people that didn't answer the question. Again, there's no explanation as to why they didn't, but there has to be some kind of a reason. And uh, if it's during a week, what week works best? Again, 131 people skipped that. So I, I think. We have a, an impossible problem to try and solve because there's 23,000 people that live in town and there, there's going to be a conflict. A lot of the comments, because the end of the survey was kind of open-ended, you can say this is what I want, um, but a lot of the themes that I saw was that weeknights were not particularly good for seniors, uh, weekends were tough for parents, um, and then there were a lot of suggestions to um, split the, uh, quote, routine, kind of the budget articles. Uh, into one meeting and the uh, and I'm, I'm taking this directly from a, a comment the juicy uh, articles the, the zoning articles I presume uh, and put that into a different one I don't know if that really works but it might be something that uh, we want to at least uh, explore and of course there was um, the um, the common th complaint that meetings are too long and I do see that our town moderator is here and I do think that he's done a fantastic job and facilitating the discussion and making sure that everybody has the ability to be heard. Um, you know, you don't need to agree with somebody, but uh, everybody does have the right to be heard, and I do think that uh, our, our open town meeting is, a, uh, is the most direct uh, way to make decisions for uh, the town. The, the, the preferences that I did uh, take note of, in spite of those uh, that skipped, uh, was that there seemed to be both for, if it was on a Saturday or during the week, the fourth uh, week in April, so the last week in April, so one week earlier than where we currently are, there did seem to be somewhat of a preference for that. Again, it wasn't, it was, you know, less than 10% over the second place preference, but um, I think that this, this survey was a good first step. I would suggest that uh, now that we've gone and said, 
here's your spread of, of what we can choose from, I think maybe we narrow it and, and come up with two or three options and say maybe do another survey if the bylaw committee is still willing to, to do that, work in conjunction with that to say does this work and uh, I think that the thing that we need to be mindful of is that our state over the last few years my understanding is gets later and later in terms of when they're resolving the budget which um, because there are a lot of different line items in our budget that's really dependent on how much aid we're getting from Boston uh, we we want to if we can't eliminate the guesswork that the town manager's office is doing and trying to figure out how much money is going to be there and how much we have to spend um, that it, at least we create an environment where we're mitigating the amount of guesswork that's there uh, I mean it the, the governor just issued his proposed budget what was it January 22nd 2020 yeah and um, that's just the governor it has to go through the legislature next and that that takes a couple months so it's frustrating that we have to wait but I, I do think that there's some valuable uh, things to take away from this I think that uh, we should continue to follow up and just if I could touch upon you real quick, yep. and I, I totally agree. I would want to see the town election first and then the town meeting following the following Saturday. I mean, I understand school vacation is April 13th. It's, well, for all intents and purposes, even though it should, starts on, I believe, the 15th, but it's uh, April 13th. People go away that weekend. They spend the whole week. So, I mean, here's a couple of dates that, you know, for us to consider. Whether it's this time or next time, maybe March 28, 2020, that would be the town meeting, and then March 21st, 2020 that could be the town election I mean that's the best can, that can I can say those again sorry I, I mean I would offer if we could discuss this I would suggest the bylaw committees is all done we've done our work it's all set and as you know the clerk did talk about she gave her uh, you know uh, her speech at the last annual town meeting when it comes to committee reports but we did talk about this about changing it even though we didn't get brought up that's fine and I know maybe not being a little too late on it I would think the bottom line is March 28, 2020, that would be the town meeting. And then March 21st, 2020, that would be the town election. And as I did talk to Mr. Ruggiero, most of the sports start mid-March, but not a lot as the season. As the weather's better, the sports get more because they have, I guess, the traveling. He mentioned that you have the traveling um, basketball and youth soccer starts up around mid-March, but it just gets busy as time goes on. So it would defeat the purpose if we had it, like, say, the second week in May, which it's nice out. I mean, when people at town meeting, when it's like 70 degrees out, they're at Home Depot, Mahoney's, they're doing their shrubs. I mean, let's try to make it customer friendly to these folks. Let's try to have it sometime in March. And if people don't show up and something happens in their neighborhood, well, shame on, shame on them if they didn't go vote. You know, we're trying to make it as easy as possible. And those are two dates that maybe yeah. we could consider putting a warrant article this year and then uh, implement it for next year. I don't know if that's too soon or not. Jeff, I do respect the fact you've got to work the budget, but I'm just trying to make this more customer friendly to residents. So you, That's it. You do bring up a good point. The, one of the trends that was very evident was the, the later, um, the later into spring, closer to summer that you got, the more people, the responses were essentially, no, I, I want to be, a, I don't be doing anything else other than sit in a gym, uh, high school auditorium for, for. Uh, an entire Saturday so that that was certainly a trend I'm trying to do this as late as possible not earlier and the latest that we could do it with those dates March 28th and March 21st that's the latest that would work for everybody and the kids when they get their vacation they could go away and we still don't have to worry about the uh, election of the town meeting mr. Bendel thank you thank you mr. chairman uh, certainly a good discussion that we have um, glad we're having it Definitely heard from quite a few folks, uh, not only in the survey, but just talking to folks. One of the things that I'm concerned about is the seniors. I can recall a couple years back, uh, Terry, we had a uh, forum at the high school regarding senior housing, and it was late at night, and we didn't get the greatest attendance. And the feedback we heard from folks was that the seniors didn't want to drive at night, which I think is understandable. So we certainly, uh, I'm, I'm cautious of that, and knowing that the seniors are less likely to drive at night. Some are, some aren't, but uh, certainly. And the other thing I have about uh, uh, the start time, you know, maybe we look at a different start time. Maybe is it earlier in the morning instead of 1030? Is it later in the evening on a Saturday so folks could get to those uh, first communions? I remember last year my godson was having his first communion. I had to juggle both uh, to be there myself. So uh, the other thing I worry about in March, though, is if we look at last year's March, we had six snow, five or six snow days in March uh, at school. So I, we, we're still running into weather. I would just 
to offer the question what would happen if we were ever to be snowed out if we were to be in March um, which unfortunately is a possibility here in New England and then uh, just uh, comments on the um, the possibility of going to the uh, multiple nights uh, I personally like the one day I like to get it done with uh, on one day you know mock your calendar in advance and know that that's going to be the day um, I'm worried that folks who have concerns about uh, certain individuals or a individual who abuses uh, the system that we have I would I would wonder how they would how they would react if it was on multiple nights would they would we find themselves uh, with those individuals uh, very few uh, abusing the system we have three nights in a row when we have CCD going on and youth sports soccer baseball and scouts and whatever it might be and and I'm I worry if uh, it has to be if a conversation has to be carried into the next evening does somebody miss out because they have another commitment? You know, I, I know that everybody's busy and everyone has a great uh, deal of things going on. And I know that giving up this one day can be really uh, difficult for families, but I wonder how much more difficult would it be to have give up three nights in a row? Um, you know, I would, arg I would make the argument that most families that I know would have a hard time freeing up three days in a row. So I worry about that. I worry about the seniors. I worry about the weather. But certainly it's a great conversation to have. Uh, it was interesting to see some of the comments that uh, people wrote, um, but you break up a good point that you know it was really uh, curious as why people left things blank, but that's okay too. So I, I also would just want to add that, and it's been mentioned that the town moderator is here. I didn't know if I would it would be appropriate if I could yield some of my time to him if he feels like he wants to, and I don't want to put him on the spot, but certainly be happy to yield some of my time if that's appropriate, Mr. Chair. Sure. Mr. Moderate. I would actually love to speak on this. Um, I don't have any opposition to moving at the data town meeting, and I think you're staying right within the sweet spot of where you're going to see your um, your highest attendance, I believe, across the Commonwealth. Was, it's about a 5% attendance when you get, when it grows, when a town grows, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's citizens that it can, it can drop a little bit. But I would, uh, I would, ask the board uh, when considering moving a date that you also consider uh, taking a holistic approach to this uh, this issue of town meeting and uh, I mean I'm sure you're those of you up here have heard or plenty of times that it's, it's long sometimes an arduous process it can be bared down um, all those things are true uh, and there are things that can be uh, that can be looked at to try to speed that along whether it be uh, if they have to be flushed out consent agendas whether we look at electronic voting at what cost uh, would come to the town. Uh, you read some figures as low as six thousand, but a town my size, you're looking at probably somewhere in the twenty thousands, and that's for rental equipment per meeting. Uh, so the cost of town would have to bear. Um, I would also suggest that there's, there's been plenty of towns around the Commonwealth who have uh, formed town meeting review committees. Uh, that they have cross-section review from those around town. I think that's uh, much more effective than a simple survey, or, the, or a survey at all. Um, it would, or not, I shouldn't say more effective, I say it could build on that survey now that we know where our baseline stands, uh, perhaps forming a, um, a town um, meeting review committee. Uh, again, uh, get, get a cross section of the community to see. Uh, I know there are some folks who do prefer um, weekdays over weekends, whether it be one meeting or two meetings spread over a couple weeks. Um, I've read some data myself that shows that. Uh, if not, you're not, we're going to see a precipitous increase on a, a weeknight over a weekend. It's actually, some say, depending on the size of your community, uh, Saturday might be the way to go. Um, it's not for me, that's not my decision to make. That's, that's going to be the town's decision to make, or if, they, if it's ever brought to the town meeting floor uh, for a vote. Uh, but I do strongly uh, suggest that if you're going to, if this is going to be an issue brought up, uh, again, a date, and they, they, don't, they can be mutually exclusive. You can do a date and then take this on as well. Uh, that the board does consider doing some sort of town uh, town meeting review committee, uh, get some vested individuals in here, uh, and we look at such things as you know, consent agendas relative to uh, articles that um, might be able to handle together, um, stuff or mechanisms to speed things along. Uh, I know electronic voting is a, a big thing. Uh, the last poll or last article I read, there was 13 towns in the Commonwealth, but that was dated 2017, so there might be more now. Um, and the, the reason people like electronic voting is it gets rid of the, the voice voter, standing voter, so on and so forth. Uh, but it does come at a cost, and is the town willing to take that cost on, especially in uh, an open town meeting? Uh, we're not like Falmouth. Falmouth has a, uh, and I, I point them out specifically because they actually have the, the clicker voting or electronic voting, uh, and they were able to purchase the system themselves. And I believe it's 
excuse me, I might have misspoke to the Falmouth are born, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, but they purchased it, and <coughs> when cited in an article I read, the town moderator said it, 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 um, it streamlined the meeting because it also allows you to take votes by clickers. There's no voice vote. It's almost instantaneous. It displays on the screen behind them. Uh, it also allows people going to a meeting on these quote-unquote hot-button hot, uh, hot topics um, to make their vote without having to stand up or without having to do a voice vote. Uh, so all things that should be considered, again, date changes, um, that might be the way to go, get it away from the first communion aspect, uh, keeping it right around where Mr. McCoy suggested I would suggest on this purely town meeting purpose for, for attendance, that would probably be as, you know, as early as you go back into in March and April, uh, also being considered of the, the budget process as well. Um, so again, my, my overarching theme here is that I would suggest uh, that the board consider at least a, a town meeting review committee uh, to address all of these issues, uh, again, I think it should be a holistic approach to streamlining our, uh, streamlining, uh, our town meeting process and also educating individuals uh, on the, the, the happenings of town meeting so they can make <coughs> informed votes and also can drive up that participation. Thank you. Yes. No, I was just going to say that I, I know Brookline has uh, electronic voting too. Mm -hmm. I've been to their town meeting in the past mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just a click of the button and it's, it, works instantaneously. Uh, I would prefer the Saturday myself, yeah. um, but I would be mindful of what the town manager and even the town accountant would have to say when it comes to the budget, if that's too early to have it or not. So, you know, I would, I would want to hear uh, from both uh, in that regard. Yeah, if I could, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with Selectman Bendel. We should keep it on a Saturday. And I think the moderator, who does an outstanding job, I really believe a uh, town review committee. But I would like to see us maybe change the date, say, now. At least put it on to the town warrant. I'd be happy to make a motion. Yeah. And the bottom line is, and, I, and I'm not going to do this for selfish reasons, as an incumbent, we all know that when the election's the third Saturday in, uh, it, uh, what is it, the last Saturday in April, when it's 70, 75 degrees out, People don't go vote. As a strong incumbent, like a lot of folks here, you don't mind that because you get your vote, you're going to win. I see that. I, w I don't care about that. I would love to make it customer friendly. I would love to see thousands of people come out to vote. And whoever they pick, they pick. I think that would be great to show to the residents that we're customer friendly. We want you people to get involved. A lot of times I hate it when I hear people say, oh, geez, how come that got built there? I go, did you go to the town meeting? And I try to do straight talk with folks. Did you go to the town meeting? No. Then what do you expect? You know, did, you know, if you vote a certain way, that's what happens. So I would like us to entertain maybe it would be like, I was looking here, and believe me, I didn't bring my checkbook, but I brought this. Uh, on 2019, there were five Saturdays in March, 2019. 2020, 2021, there were four Saturdays. My suggestion would be the very last Saturday of the month in March would be the town meeting, and the second to the last Saturday, we would well, ther theoretically say the third, but once again, there's five, another, what, nine years from now, it would be five uh, Saturdays in March. You know, and so I just kicked that around for discussion. I would like to come out of here with us to put a warrant article, and don't forget, it's going to be this annual town meeting. It's going to either vote yay or nay. You know, and then I do agree with the uh, moderator to have a subcommittee, have a town review committee at another time for the following year. So I kick that around to you, gentlemen. I'd happy to make a motion to get this thing ball going, and that's even for next year's election too. Uh, Thank you. Quickly, I do agree. I, I think, uh, Mr. Peterson, I think it's a great idea to have um, a town meeting review committee because town meeting is the governing body of this community. Um, and um, I would rather a solution come from the community, to be honest with you, than this board. Um, I, I don't want to make a change now and then have to change it again later. Like in a, another year, like I don't want to have two straight years where we're changing when we're having um, town meeting uh, happen. I, I would pref my preference is to start a town a town meeting review committee um, as soon as possible and, and um, I guess solicit feedback because there's there's a lot of there's a lot of good in, in the results of the survey, but I think that there's a lot of questions that I had that need to kind of um, we need to do a little bit more digging to figure out you know, why are people not responding to this, but they are to this, uh, and what works best to really engage um, 
our population so that they're coming out because I mean, we, we see the empty chairs up there and, and we don't want uh, the decisions being made by you know a few dozen folks we want we want we want to have as many people showing up and participating in the process as possible. Maybe that's why we need to grab the bull by the horns, us as the executive board, just to say this is what we're going to do and to encourage uh, folks to come to the town meeting or uh, vote in election because we have another survey. I'm not saying that's going to happen. We may only get maybe another 100 more, 100 less in a survey. Sometimes you've got to make an executive decision to say, I think this is the best for the interest in the community. You talk about customer service. You want to take care of the residents. You always hear them. How can I get to the town meeting? How can I go vote? So here's an opportunity to take that and change that. Mm -hmm. So, and I respect what you have to say, uh, Selectman Eaton, but you know, I'd offer a motion if it really took today. I still think we can do it in two phases. I truly believe that. I'd like to make a motion that we introduce a warrant article at this annual town meeting and to change uh, the town meeting date from the very last Saturday to March and the second to the latest Saturday, which we would say the third Saturday, but once again, there's five Saturdays in uh, this uh, particular year uh, for the town election. And I'd like to make that in the form of a motion just to get this thing going and let the uh, townspeople vote at the town meeting. They may like it the way it is, you know, and, but now there's an opportunity, folks, to get to the town meeting to make some change in this. Okay, there's a motion. Uh, is there a second? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll second that motion for discussion because I haven't said anything about the subject yet. I agree with what everyone's saying up here, it does need to be, I believe it has to be on a Saturday. Because um, we, we did do a survey. We had a, we had a, we talked a couple meetings a year and a half, two years ago about senior housing and let's have that meeting on a Saturday at the high school because we were anticipating a large quantity of people to be there and there wasn't people there. And like Mr. Bendel said, I, I talked to some people about this subject and I'm not going to drive at night. It's too much, and three or four nights in a row. So on a Saturday in March is a better idea than in three or four nights in a row, in my opinion. Um, but I agree with what Mr. Eaton just said. Let's not, let's not do this two times, two years in a row. Um, let's have a, a, a review committee, but l let's just add one little caveat, that they have to have something decided so we can put on the warrant article for next year. And so it's not dragged out a couple of years and then it's forgotten about, like a sub fire station. Let, let's let's um let's make let's put a subcommittee together. Let's let's get it going now, and get a group together quickly so we can have the discussion. And it's on next year's next year's um town, for the town people because, like Mr. Eaton just said, I'd rather have the town people decide not my yay or nay vote tonight. So that's all I really want to say. Are you, Mr. Oh. Thank you. Oh. Uh, just a couple of comments. As was earlier noted, the uh, clearly one of the issues that, that I deal with when preparing the budget is trying to get some idea as to what the revenues are in the town. Clearly, as was noted earlier in the prior presentation, uh, the largest piece of that is is the property tax, but the uh, next largest is state aid. So uh, state aid is a function of the budget. The, as was noted earlier, the governor doesn't present his budget till the end of January. Uh, if there's going to be a March town meeting at the end of March, that means I have to have a budget presented to the board uh, by the end of December, um, well before even the governor issues his uh, budget, and then of course uh, uh, the legislature does uh, their own thing, and then typically we find out in June or July what state aid is. So it just be creates a greater level of uncertainty, um, you know, from my perspective in terms of putting the budget together. And I guess the only other point I would make is that clearly we've had some town meetings. You, uh, many will recall the town meeting when the school was. Uh, authorized where there was a significant number of people that showed up. So I think, you know, to, I, I, I understand the desire to uh, obtain more participation. I think we ought to continue to do that. But I think to some measure it's a function of what the topics are on the, uh, at the town meeting. Uh, and, you know, when people really want to turn out, whether it's uh, pursuing authorization for a rink or uh, building a high school or building the middle school or 
you know, people turn out when they, when, when there are issues uh, like that that they want to be heard on. So, um, you know, I'm not sure that there's any particular date that's going to elicit a significant groundswell of people showing up at a town meeting. With all due respect, Mr. Uh, Manager, Mr. all those uh, comments, those were special town meetings. When we had the rink, I believe that was a special town meeting. Uh, the schools is special town meetings, I believe, unless I'm wrong. You know, I thought those were special, so I'm just talking about the, the annuals. And I'm sorry to interrupt. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Um, so there's a motion. There's a second. Um, I would be inclined myself to take the approach of Mr. Eaton and Mr. Loud and develop a subcommittee for them to come back uh, by next year's uh, town meeting to um, give us a um, report on which way to go. And I would be in favor, of, again, uh, to keep it on the Saturday. Okay, uh, there's a motion to uh, make, uh, put out a warrant for um, town, annual town meeting, annual town meeting okay. for uh, the would it be the third Saturday and the then dates, for the yes. election and the yeah. fourth Saturday without giving the dates? Yeah. Yeah. Be March would be yeah. the third Saturday election and the fourth Saturday, fourth Saturday would be for town meeting. Town meeting. But obviously, if there was five Saturdays, yeah. I'm just going to refer to town council. Is there any uh, issue that you see with with this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, election uh, town elections are governed by Chapter 30. Uh, 39 section 9a town meeting is governed by chapter 39 section 10 both of those give a, a certain range and flexibility i um, talking about how the election and the town meeting have to take place between february and june of the year obviously getting everything done before the end of the fiscal year so you have a a range of time there's no, nothing believe it on the statute that specifies that the election has to have happened before uh town meeting but it is tradition to have the annual election prior to the a the annual town meeting and uh some towns had them on the same warrant others have uh, two separate warrants uh that's a matter of tradition but in terms of statutory requirements uh and obviously you know a, a, a charter would supersede but uh statutory and and bylaw provisions um the the, the process you're discussing would, would would be appropriate there's nothing that would prohibit the changing of the dates within the time frame that the selectmen specified thank you because this motion does that thank you okay is everybody clear on the motion okay all those in favor of the motion to go with the uh, third saturday in march as the election and the fourth saturday as the town meeting and that would not be this year now that would be next year um all those in favor one all opposed four i, I would like to make a motion to form a town meeting uh, review committee uh, my hope would be that by the end of 2019 uh, that committee could come up to a um, come up with a recommendation so that for the 2020 town meeting uh, during the uh, committee reports you can kind of explain the process and there'll be an, uh, an article on that year's warrant um, to be voted on Okay, there's a motion by Mr. Eaton to establish a town meeting review committee. Just and I would, would hope that the town moderator would be uh, involved in that. And there's a second for discussion by Mr. Bendel. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to support uh, this motion. And I hope that we will look at the, uh, the dates that Mr. McCoy offered. Um, and I just hope that they'll be able to uh, further review those dates, perhaps the times, um, and so that uh, all the departments would have a chance to weigh in on that date. I would hate to have a conversation here tonight maybe miss something um, that we weren't thinking of uh, and perhaps uh, involving all the departments members of the community a moderator and uh, certainly hopefully we can come up with a date that works again I do support a Saturday it sounds like most of the members up here all the members up here support Saturday uh, and now we can uh, leave it up to the committee to find out which of those Saturdays will be best for the residents and relative to the discussion yes. if we do form that committee I'd like to you know be a member from this board maybe to be on that committee to make that recommendation so that's at another meeting obviously so thank you thank you Any, anyone Chairman, else I'll, yeah. if, if we have to put an amendment on the motion to include mr mccoy i have no problem with that but i also um the moderator was here speaking earlier and thank you for being here mr moderator he had some other ideas about electronic voting i hope that committee also brings that 
but I also, again, would like to have it <coughs> mandated that, that they um, come up with a plan for next year's town meeting so the town people can vote on uh, when the election is going to be in the, in, the, in the town meeting. Thank you. Okay, so let's, um, uh, there's a motion, there's a second uh, to establish a uh, town meeting review committee. Um, it's so it's time fair. certain that they finish uh, their deliberation for next mm -hmm. next uh, year's uh, um, town, town meeting. meeting for the warrant. Yes, Mr. Uh, just a question. So, um, uh, for purposes of setting up this uh, committee, what uh, uh, is it the intent of the board to appoint the committee, and how? If so, how many people will you be appointing to the committee? And uh, just I think we need to be clear on the logistics. Yeah. Any suggestions? Well, I mean, just yeah. a suggestion. Why don't we have 15 people on the committee, each of us pick three? Just off the top of my head, 15 people, we could probably get a pretty good cross-section. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moderator, any suggestions on that, yeah, since I you've been involved in the... That seems okay. Uh, I know that as recently as 2017, South Faro did their town meeting uh, review committee. I think they had, a member, they had six persons on that committee, with the uh, administrator being the ex-officio. Um, so I think they're... I think they're hovering right around 10,000. I believe, can't quote me on that for uh, population, so I think uh, for one thing, sort of hovering around 23. Uh, 15 sounds pretty good to me. Um, and I, you know, I'm not commenting on this really, so who, who picks what, but it doesn't seem that that seems like a good number. Maybe Mr. Chairman, there was another, before we get to do this, maybe we should wait another meeting or two. That way we can maybe establish the ground rules uh, between us from now until then. And then vote it in a couple of meetings from now. I mean, it's not a big rush now, so. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mr. McCoy. Yeah. 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 So we're gonna. The 15 yeah. seems like a lot to me, but I would agree with Mr. Right. McCoy that we have further discussion on it, the establishment. Okay. okay. Um, so, any other discussion? Okay. All in favor of uh, establishing a town meeting review committee, uh, signify. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, communications, Mr. Hull. Uh, first under communications uh, is a memo uh, to the board uh, outlining a process for uh, replacement of the town accountant. You'll recall uh, that we had the Collins Center uh, evaluate the town's financial uh, structure uh, and specifically uh, the recommendation that came back was to establish a finance director slash town accountant uh, to replace our <coughs> retiring uh, town accountant. Uh, this uh, position would oversee uh, treasury and collections, uh, accounting and assessing. Uh, so what I've done is uh, suggested a a timeline here for the board to uh, consider uh, with respect to this process. So uh, the first uh, uh, suggestion is that we begin uh, advertising immediately. Let me just preface my comments by saying per the uh, Town Managers Act, the position of town accountant or uh, finance director town accountant uh, is, is appointed by the Board of Selectmen. So I would suggest uh, immediately uh, advertising the position uh, in the Mass Municipal Association's uh, website, Mass Municipal Auditors and Accountants Association, and the Mass Collector Treasurers Association, uh, that we state in the ad that the, uh, uh, we, we not uh, state a sp particular deadline, but with the expectation that uh, the start date would be June 3rd that a, a screening uh, committee be established. Uh, in particular, I think it would be appropriate uh, to have uh, the current town accountant uh, serve on that uh, committee, uh, myself, and the uh, assistant uh, town manager, uh, perhaps uh, um, one or two uh, members of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, just in terms of a rough timeline that we look at uh, beginning uh, to review resumes uh, uh, and establish an interview pool the week of March 4th, uh, week of the 11th of March to conduct preliminary interviews with candidates, uh, week of March 18th, uh, prepare a recommended short list of candidates uh, for the Board of Selectmen uh, to interview, and then between the weeks of the 20, March 25th and April 1st, 
uh, Board of Selectmen would interview candidates um, week of uh, April 8th, Board of Selectmen to uh, make a job offer to, uh, in terms to a particular candidate, and then that um, a week uh, that uh, I would uh, work with the preferred candidate to uh, establish the final terms uh, with the board voting on the 22nd of uh, April uh, to make the final uh, appointment. This would allow the person uh, to give notice. Presumably this person is going to require, um, their employer is going to require at least uh, 30 days, perhaps as much as 60 days notice. Uh, so this would allow the person to be able to do that and uh, have um, a period of time to transition with uh, Mike Morris. Thank you. Uh, does, I don't want to put anybody on the spot here, uh, but um, is anyone interested in serving on the review committee? You don't have to tell me tonight, but you can certainly uh, let me know uh, in the very near future. Okay. Uh, next under uh, uh, correspondence, I want to announce the appointment of the uh, town clerk. Uh, as you know, uh, our current town clerk, uh, Sharon George, is retiring at the end of the month. Uh, so it uh, great, uh, gives me a great uh, pleasure to announce uh, the appointment of Christine uh, R. Tomei Conway uh, Esquire as the, to the position of town clerk. She was the city clerk in Methuen for 17 years. Uh, prior to that, she uh, obtained her uh, law degree at Suffolk University, uh, was a practicing attorney in civil and criminal uh, law. Uh, also, uh, prior to that, worked for the uh, Internal Revenue Service as a revenue agent. Uh, so I, uh, she actually started today as the uh, town clerk designee and is working through the transition with Sharon. Uh, next under correspondence, uh, just uh, noting the uh, petition articles. There are four specific petition articles uh, this year, the first one being uh, a request, uh, a petition article from an Adam Silva uh, looking to uh, be allowed to be considered uh, for a position in the fire department. You'll recall this petition was presented last year and it was voted on uh, in the affirmative by town meeting. It required an uh, act of the legislature and uh, the, the legislature did not act on this request and so he is now uh, seeking uh, town meeting approval again. It requires uh, town meeting approval again and then would go back to the legislature for uh, potential approval. Uh, as a request uh, by David uh, Bra Brabant uh, to rezone from residential R60 to residential 10 uh, property on McDonald Road, 54 and 47 McDonald Road. Uh, Charles Fleming uh, seeking to rezone from residential 60 to residential 10 uh, property on 17 and 14 Royal Street. And then uh, Jean Marie Cole uh, seeking to purchase town property on Canyon Street. Uh, next is a correspondence uh, that was uh, sent to Mr. Veerman. Be uh, uh, with regard to uh, essentially placing him on notice about the potential uh, executive session uh, that was scheduled for this evening. I'm sorry, did you skip? Shelley Newhouse. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Shelley Newhouse, uh, the uh, health director, uh, provided information to the board on uh, plans for uh, the notice of the plastic ban plastic bag ban that will uh, take effect on uh, uh, in May, May 4th. Uh, and she is going through a number of efforts. She's contacted uh, the retailers, uh, Market Basket and the various uh, supermarkets throughout town. Uh, she'll also be putting information up on the website uh, as well as sending, uh, using Twitter to communicate uh, the informa information out to uh, residents. So that's uh, going to be a, a work in progress. Uh, so next is the uh, letter to Mr. Veerman, which I just spoke uh, of. It was put on notice. 
Uh, next is a memorandum uh, to the Board of Appeals. Uh, it just uh, notes uh, at the Board of Selectmen's meeting on January 28th, 2019, remember the public raised allegations of conflict of interest involving the proposed development at 362 Middlesex Ave. No specific circumstances were provided, so no conclusion may be drawn from these allegations. The town has full confidence in its volunteer boards and commissions and appreciates the service <laughs> provided by all individuals serving on these boards and commissions. Each member is responsible for taking the State Ethics Commission Conflict of Interest exam in order to demonstrate an understanding of the Conflict of Interest law. Compliance with that law is a personal obligation for each member and is of paramount importance when decisions are being made that impact the town. The town is confident that all members adhere to the legal requirements applicable to their service. Your cooperation uh, in this regard is greatly appreciated, as is your service to the town of Wilmington. Uh, we have uh, correspondence. This is, uh, comes in the form of an email uh, from uh, Jenny Charbonneau. Uh, it's with regard to the 362 uh, Middlesex uh, development. It raises some legal issues and cites case laws to the applicability of um, uh, the accommodations statute in this regard. We also have correspondence uh, from M.J. Burns uh, to the board uh, that raises uh, concerns about um, Mr. Veerman and seeking that he recuse himself from further involvement in the 362 project. Uh, we have correspondence from Minuteman uh, senior services. Uh, this is with regard to their annual March for Meals campaign, uh, and it uh, provides information about that event, provides contact information. It's encouraging the Board of Selectmen uh, to uh, participate in that program. Uh, we also have a letter from uh, Edward Loud, Sr., and I'll read this into the record. Uh, Chairman Kyra, please accept this letter of my resignation from uh, my selectman position. My last day will be February 12, 2019. As said previously, I've taken a job opportunity out of state where I will be spending 90% of my time out of the town of Wilmington. Uh, this is the reason for my resignation. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Loud. That's it for correspondence. Okay. Board to consider. Uh, board to consider a request from uh, Terry Marciello uh, writing today to make a formal request uh, to use the town common on, th on Saturday, April 27, 2019 from 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Uh, rain date Saturday, May 11, 2019 to host a celebration of World Tai Chi Day. I'll move to grant the request. Second. Second is a uh, motion by Mr. Bendel, seconded by Mr. Eaton. Any discussion? Oh, no, was it you or was it Mr. Loud? I'm sorry, matter. Mr. Loud. They sounded alike. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? That's your now. It's your last meeting. I keep, uh, you have to get there. Uh, next is a board to consider a request from uh, Karen Campbell, Recreation Director, on behalf of the Recreation Department requesting permission to conduct the annual Easter egg hunt uh, on uh, the town common on Saturday, April 20th uh, at uh, 11 a.m. So moved. Motion by Mr. Lau. Second. Seconded by Mr. Bendel. Any discussion? All in favor? And that's unanimous. And then uh, finally, under a board to consider uh, is the uh, recommendation for the hiring process that was presented in my memo with respect to uh, the finance director slash town accountant process. Motion by Mr. Eaton, seconded by Mr. Bendel. 
Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? And that's unanimous. Was there a board member that wanted to? <coughs> uh, they'll okay. get a hold of me, I guess. Right, if, unless there's a board member that wants to serve now, or you can think about it and yeah, get a hold of me for the next meeting. I have a few questions just so I'll, I can do that with you, Mr. Hall, offline. Okay. okay. Okay, now we're on to uh, public comments. Um, let me just uh, begin by uh, explaining the public comments as I saw it over the last uh, two meetings. Um, it changed just a little bit on the last meeting and the one before that. And the reason why I, I changed it up a bit uh, was to avoid uh, violating the open meeting law. Uh, just let me uh, explain for a minute my understanding and, and provide you a quick example. Uh, at the last meeting on the agenda was the town budget. Uh, there were several residents outside the hall uh, and at the conclusion of the um, town budget, um, several came in under public comments. And I instructed the board at the time that um, under public comments that they should write down the, the questions and, and answer them if they choose to. Um, and this way here, um, if there's a question that's not on the agenda, then it, there's no way that we can violate the open meeting. So for example, um, there was a person who asked a question regarding the budget on the heating system. So that was, we were able to answer, but it seemed like the majority of the questions uh, pertain to um, uh, the location of the detox center. So under the open meeting law, we can't engage in substantive uh, conversation and back and forth, um, but we can discuss it on our end when we get to the new business portion. So that's why I did that, uh, just so to avoid uh, violating the open meeting law. Just for example, tonight, we talked about at the very beginning, I mentioned Restusha Rink. It's not on the agenda, but we can discuss it under new business. So if questions are posed to us about Restusha Rink, I would caution the board um, to write those questions down and, and then respond to them under new business. Um, it, uh, as uh, social media has it, it uh, being a conspiracy that I've changed it or not being transparent, it's just a bunch of bunk. Uh, as I see it, uh, uh, I'm trying to avoid uh, causing a, a violation of the open meeting law. And I think, um, and, it, and it is a, a somewhat of a complicated law, and uh, we have uh, our town council here, and uh, they've, uh, they'll be providing us a seminar on the open meeting law sometime in the end of March or the beginning of April. Um, part of their um, contract is to provide us two seminars a, a year, and that is going to be one of them. And I think I pretty much got that uh, correct. Uh, town Council? Yeah. I agree. Okay. So let's uh, begin with some of the uh, questions that were posed at the last meeting, maybe we can get to some of the answers uh, that that uh, happened at the last public comments. Uh, we'll start with, um, there was a question on the heating, and we put that off until this meeting. Um, you had, um, we're going to get a hold of Mr. Hooper to look into yes. that. Yeah. yeah, I did speak with George Hooper, our uh, public building superintendent. Uh, he indicated that uh, geothermal uh, is effective in some areas of the country. In uh, the Northeast, it isn't as effective um, given the uh, colder temperatures. Um, the uh, water is drawn up, uh, it remains at a fairly consistent temperature of about 55 degrees. It needs to be heated, uh, so there's electrical pumps involved, and then uh, uh, in the heat is sometimes difficult to get above 68 degrees, which requires supplemental electric heat. And uh, so from a cost standpoint, uh, it doesn't uh, really work uh, in, uh, in our situation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question that was brought forward uh, to us uh, was why don't we make um, the area proposed at the detox a, a railroad station, underground parking, 
uh, retail, um, um, I think it was mentioned a restaurant, some housing, and uh, to get a hold of the developer to see if they would do that and also bring in sewerage, uh, bring in the line. So. I, I have had discussions with um, Mr. Neeland. Uh, uh, there is um, not an uh, in indication that he is looking to necessarily um, change the use. I would say that the uh, discussions are ongoing, um, but uh, at least preliminarily, um, it uh, does not appear that uh, I think it would be a long shot to um, expect that um, we would be able to establish another use for that property. Yeah. Uh, another question that was brought up was uh, regarding town council, why, why this board fired uh, the previous town council that's also been out there on social media as well. And please, gentlemen, you can join in uh, at any time you wish. Uh, but the town council that we previously had was not fired. Um, and I believe the former chairman was here as well. He can add as well. Uh, the town council dissolved. They disbanded. They broke apart. They split up. Uh, they were no longer in existence. Uh, they broke into two different firms. Um, and we were going to be without a town council as of July 1st. So uh, at the time, I believe we were talking about uh, seeing if the, um, the firm that split, if, if one of those uh, two firms would um, be amenable to stay on a couple of months while we would go through an RFP process to try to um, look for different uh, firms that would be interested. Um, and it was myself that wanted to get it resolved before July 1st and to start that process. Um, and we did. Uh, what had happened is that uh, we put out an RFP. Um, we received, I think, seven or eight um, firms right, well, uh, that were interested. Uh, you had, uh, the town manager had uh, some department heads uh, vet those um, RFPs that came in, uh, requests for proposals, uh, narrowed them down to about four, I believe. Mm. Yes. And then we had an open meeting with the interviews of, of uh, the, the various uh, firms that made it to the final. And uh, it is my feeling that we hired the best uh, firm, and that is KP Law. Uh, and that's, that's what happened as far as my recollection is. Uh, the prior uh, firm was not fired. Uh, they split. They became two. Uh, and one of them actually was one of the four finalists. Um, and we also uh, ended up hiring a special counsel um, to handle the environmental uh, aspects that are taking place over at, at the Superfund site that is Olin, uh, that most people refer to it as. Uh, that special counsel is Dan Deutsch. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, yes. I would just add uh, one uh, slight correction there. Okay. We received, or I received notice, the board received notice. Uh, I believe it was the beginning of March that the firm was disbanding as of March 31st. So we, you know, did not have an awful lot of time to respond. Uh, ultimately, there was an agreement uh, that the board reached on a uh, preliminary basis to extend uh, the uh, town council services to uh, Brooks Dorensis. You'll recall it was originally uh, Deutsch Williams was the firm that we had contracted with, or the board had contracted with for many years. Uh, so uh, Brooks Dorensis provided legal services uh, during that interim period from uh, March through uh, the, well, actually April through uh, the uh, end of June. And during that time was when we went through the uh, request for proposal process. Okay. Yes, I'm just reading. Things. Sure. Um, Attorney John Foskett was kind of the town's point person from Deutsch Williams, and he was not, he did not stay with Brooks and Dorensis when the firm kind of went their separate ways. And many of the employment law attorneys 
uh, did not stay with Brooks and Drenzers. They did have one uh, attorney that does do employment law, um, but um, I'm not sure if he had ever done any work with the town before. Um, but there was there was a good amount of turnover. It wasn't. It, it, we have a lot of unions in town, and there's a lot of collective bargaining agreements that we have to be a part of. And who is our employment law counsel is very important. Um, that combined with uh, Attorney Foskett not staying with Brooks and Durantis were things that I put a lot of weight into. Um, I have been very happy with the responsiveness for uh, KPLI. As, um, being an attorney, there's, when you boil it all down, there's really two jobs that you do. You advocate on behalf of your client, but you also advise your clients. So you educate your clients on risks. And that means sometimes uh, telling um, your client, if you do something, there's a risk that something bad might happen to you. Uh, and if it's a risk of litigation, litigation is always, uh, there's some level of uncertainty because you're taking a conflict and you're putting it in usually a, a judge's, but sometimes a jury's hand. It's not really a jury with municipal law, but um, I think KP Law has done a very good job of showing up to uh, public hearings when uh, their presence has been requested, such as tonight. Um, I think the fact that we were able to work into our agreement with uh, KP Law that they put on seminars to better educate the volunteers that serve on this board and other boards is uh, that's certainly beneficial uh, because I it was one of the, the letters that was submitted tonight was exceptionally well researched and I certainly have a lot of questions about it um, and I, I'm glad that, that we're able to pass that on to town council to um, kind of digest uh, I did ask the town manager um, to reach out uh, to somebody that we had spoken about uh, spoken with uh, actually last July who has since filed suit so it is now part of the public domain uh, again we made the decision to go with KP law at the end of Ju uh, June and on uh, our first meeting in July uh, we met with uh, attorney Jonathan Silverstein of KP law and uh, attorney Sandman um, who is part of uh, a multi-district litigation regarding opioids and what this is doing is, uh, it's, as of the time, there were 110 different communities in the Commonwealth that were going after and litigating against the distributors of opioids. And uh, seeking as damages the costs that these communities incur as a result of the opioid epidemic. That meeting does not happen but for Jonathan Silverstein of KP Law. And I am very, I, <laughs> I, I was confident back in late June that we were making the right decision. It was a decision that I put a lot of thought into. But the very first thing that happened after that was they said, let's go and hit Big Pharma hard. And they're not going to be able to get all of the damage that has happened because of the opioid epidemic in this town, because it's not just monetary. They're going after what the monetary damages to the community are, the increased costs for police services and fire services and EMTs and the increased amount of work that our senior center and veterans department have to deal with uh, because of it. They're not bringing people back to life. They, a lawsuit doesn't cure people. The, the, the proposal for 362 Middlesex Avenue has brought out a lot of emotion from most everybody in town because it strikes close to home regardless of what side of of the fence you're on. But if there is a common ground, I think it's that everybody is scared and pissed at what has happened that many people wouldn't have seen 20 years ago. I, I was in high school then, and if you told me that every month, every month or two, I'd have to text my, my brother to say another kid that we grew up with was dead because of heroin or opiates or fentanyl, which I, didn't have, I had no idea what existed until a few years ago. I, you, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have thought that it was a lie. And I'm pissed. I'm pissed that this is happening. I'm pissed that it is, has divided our community to a great extent. But I'm glad that we hired a law firm that could help get us a meeting so that we could do something about it. Again, this doesn't solve everything. 
but I think we're doing what we need to do, what we can do, the legal standing that this town has, to go after the people that were responsible for pushing pills when it wasn't appropriate. People are going to make, the, people are going to second guess every decision that we make up here, and that's fine. That's what I signed up for. That's what everybody else up here signed up for. I'm not going to apologize for that. I think that's the common ground that regardless of the rhetoric that, you, that you'll hear from one side or the other, I don't care. We're doing what we can to go after the people that are really hurting families and really hurting individuals in this community. And I think it's the right decision. I stand by it. I can be criticized for it. Take your shot. But I think this is the right decision. Hey, anybody else on the is law firm? Um, when we when we went through the process of um, hiring a new town council, at the time I thought that was the um, biggest decision that I would have had made. So I did a ton of research on all seven applicants. Um, tried communicating to the current town council, never got a response until the day that they were here for their interview. Um, and I decided in, and recommended KP Law. Since then, and this subject has come up a couple, three weeks ago, um, I've been in town hall a couple of days, a couple, three, four days, the last couple of weeks. I've asked people that interact with town council. Quicker, better responses than previous town council. That's all I have to say. My couple of interactions with KP Law, one with Mark and one with Mr. Silverstein, both quick responses and accurate responses. Um, so I know that I made the right decision back in the day and not, never would I ever criticize um, what they're doing now. So thank you. Yes. Just want to compliment my colleagues on their comments and certainly uh, I agree. I think it was actually a unanimous support from this board uh, for that effort and so we do we really thank you for that bringing that to the to our community because it's a chance for all of us uh, to get behind that conscious effort so uh, thank you and I, I would just say that you know I too have had uh, nothing but positive experiences uh, a very quick response uh, if you call they answer right away and I know that there was some reservations from folks at the beginning uh, uh, given the size of your firm I believe you represent over 100 communities in in Massachusetts so one might think well how the heck are they going to be able to get back to everybody, but that has been uh, not the case at all. So I, I'm, I really support uh, the decision to go with KP Law. I've been impressed, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful that we have them. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, yes. I just I need to correct my uh, colleague, uh, Selectman Bendel. It wasn't a unanimous vote. I did vote for the previous town council. It was four to one to vote for KP Law. And I'm a big boy. I understand they got the position. I did say to you in public certain things. I also said in public that you know, I'm looking forward to working with you on behalf of the town. I've always extended that olive branch to anybody. As long as they have the best interests of the community, I'm happy to work with anybody. I've said it for like 30 years. But my comments stand. What I stated back then, I don't change my comments. And I just want that at least people know that. That's all. Mr. Chairman, yes, thank you. Just a response. And forgive me if I misspoke, but I was referring to the vote for the go after the big pharma, I believe, was a unanimous yeah. vote, not the, not the KP law hiring. Oh, I thought that's what it sounds like. So, all right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question that was brought up is uh, a conflict of interest uh, that was uh, brought up and continuously being brought up um, regarding uh, myself and having a conflict of interest and also uh, one of the most respected uh, individuals that I know and uh, uh, with a great reputation, my brother, uh, Michael Kyra. Um, and uh, it, it really is... Um, sad it, it got so bad that uh, this past Friday um, that uh, the, the it's under the the group that concerns citizens of Wilmington put out this um, um, I guess uh, they spliced and diced the commentary that I said and that he said uh, to make it look like there was a conflict uh, there and it, it really is too bad I caution my uh, um, fellow uh, colleagues here to be careful what you say because they'll splice something and to to make it uh, meet their uh, motives as to what they want to be said or they want people to to hear uh, but it, it really was a, a sad uh, commentary on that organization's part that they had to do that to try to damage the reputation of uh, myself and in my brother uh, but uh, with that said, um, I have filed my 
uh, 268A, um, uh, but it's the Mass General Laws uh, 268A subsection 23B3, the disclosure of appearance of a conflict of interest as required. Uh, it was filed with the town clerk's office. It is a public record, so feel free to, to go to the town clerk and ask for a copy of that uh, so that you can read uh, that disclosure. Uh, next question that was asked was in regards to special town council. Would we consider hiring a special town council, which was brought up a, a few times as well. And I would refer to what uh, Mr. McCoy said a couple of meetings ago. He said that if it's warranted, uh, if it's warranted, we would uh, look into that and we would um, consider it a special town council. Uh, but. It, my feeling is that it's not warranted. I don't know about my colleagues on the, on the board here. Uh, there are certain aspects as to uh, why we would hire a special town council. Um, Mr. Yeah, yeah, certainly yeah. from my perspective in terms of uh, hiring special town council, uh, the town would consider that typically if the issue at hand or the legal matter is not uh, an area that the current council has expertise in. Uh, clearly, in this case, uh, KP has an attorney, a very able attorney, uh, Jonathan Silverstein, who has significant experience in uh, land use law. Uh, another reason why the town might consider special counsel uh, is if uh, counsel indicated that be through other uh, dealings uh, there was a conflict in terms of the uh, party that was on the other side, so to speak. Uh, KP has indicated that there is no such conflict in terms of bettering LLC. Uh, so on that basis, um, uh, there is uh, no uh, issue. And the third category from my perspective is uh, whether the uh, firm or the attorney has been uh, doing the work uh, that we expect them to in uh, terms of representing the town's best interests. You know, have they been performing essentially? In my estimation, uh, they have been performing. I know there's been allegations at the uh, public hearing that took place on the 16th that there was some offhanded comment that Mr. Silverstein made. I can say, uh, having sat, uh, stood through that entire meeting, uh, that I didn't hear any uh, comment that was suggesting that council wasn't do was doing anything other than representing the town. I also uh, rewatched that. Uh, uh, meeting on uh, WCTV uh, and uh, can once again say that uh, there were no comments uh, that I heard that would indicate uh, that Jonathan Silverstein was doing anything other than representing the town of Wilmington. So um, from my perspective, uh, those are the criteria that you need to look at um, in terms of whether special counsel is warranted. I think that uh, addressed all the questions from that meeting. Uh, so let's go further into uh, public comments. And I'll just ask you to, when you speak, just, just please uh, introduce yourself and the address as well. Yes, in the back first. Mm -hmm. Yep. Suzanne Sullivan, 60 Long Street. Um, first off, um, if there's going to be a committee for the for the um, for town meeting, um, I'd like to be on it. Considering I was the person that brought this forward to the board, so please put my name on it, if you will. Um, secondly, I still haven't received an answer. If there's the answer around, and I'm going to try to be really, really clear. Okay, there was a vote that was. Um, against the special permit for the detox, right? We all can agree on that. Now there's going to be a vote coming up where supposedly that could be overridden. <coughs> I will ask this board again if this board is going to, if that vote takes place to override the special permit, is this board going to defend that special permit? And if you're going to do that, then you're going to have to get special counsel because you already have counsel that's probably going to defend the three vote. So I will say it again, what vote is going to be defended? The vote, the three, <coughs> the, the majority vote for the special accommodation, or is it going to be the special permit vote? I keep saying it over and over again, you just danced around it, you, I, I give you an applause for the performance, but the bottom line is you have still not answered the question. 
and you have not told me what vote is going to be defended in this town. Because if that free vote takes place, it could override. That's what they're saying. I don't agree that it should override the special permit vote, but they're the ones that are saying it. Even council said it at that meeting. This isn't about whether council is good or council bad. Council said at that meeting that that vote would override the special permit vote. And I want to know, does this board be believe that also? And if not, what are you going to do about it? The only thing I can see that you do about it is hire special counsel. Mr. Wright. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Just uh, a brief response, and, and I know we, I recall the, the question coming up at the last minute, uh, last meeting rather. Um, with respect to uh, the decision process, uh, keep in mind the, uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals is an independent quasi-judicial uh, board that makes decisions on uh, matters within its purview. It acts independently under its statutory authority. The Board of Selectmen does not direct or mandate the actions of the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals um, hears matters that are brought before it and makes decisions on those matters. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, the, board, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals may make a second decision on the same matter would be based upon the applications brought by, by the applicants. Ultimately, the determination as to what decision to, uh, to defend is based upon what decision is challenged. The Zoning Board of Appeals doesn't decide which decisions are challenged. The, the challenge is brought by uh, um, a, a party that's aggrieved by the decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals. If a decision is made and not challenged, that decision stands. If a decision is challenged, then it's, it's the decision then of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the town to defend that decision. So at, at this point, it's, it's not possible to answer the question as to what decision will be defended, because at this point, we don't have an appeal from, from a decision. We are aware that there's been a request for this uh, um, special, this, this reasonable accommodation, and that's a matter that will be taken up by the Zoning Board of Appeals. But at this point, there is, there is no appeal pending, so there's no challenge to a decision that's been made by the Zoning Board of Appeals. When that challenge is made, based upon what the challenge is, the, the defense will be mounted. And uh, of course, the, the uh, town council would represent the Zoning Board of Appeals as, as, as through uh, the, the Board of Selectmen's approval to uh, undertake the defense of whatever decision is, is subject to challenge. Thank you, Mr. Mr. McCoy. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I can say, I'm not really interested on what position town council is going to defend. I brought this up a meeting ago, and I'm still, and I think a lot of folks are really confused out there. I sat in those meetings from day one. I saw that vote was three to two, not to vote for the uh, special permit. As far as I'm concerned, it's defeated. I'm out in the hallway, thought it was all over. Now I'm hearing that there's a possibility of vote of a simple majority turning that vote over. I said back then, I said, through you, Mr. Chairman, we have town council here, and you said we're still looking at it. I firmly believe you need a super majority for that special permit. I don't believe if the whatever razzle-dazzle that I see happening out there, that if there's a vote three to two, I can't see that superseding the super permit with the four votes. I don't see that. I really don't see that. And I've got a problem with that. I, re I heard Selectman Loud, and he put it better, eloquently better than I. He served on the Board of Appeals, and he can talk for himself about over 15 years. He never saw it relative to the accommodation. He knows better about the language than I do. But I'll say it again, and I'm asking you, in simple terms, I don't believe a 3-2 vote this Wednesday overturns that special permit of the defeat. Three, they still need a supermajority. I believe four. And I know I asked you and you said you were still looking at the law. I heard someone say that there may not be a law that exists. I'm asking you right now through the chairman. I believe I'm right. I still believe that you need a super majority to overturn anything, not a simple majority. The only thing I can think of is they can have the right of a simple majority to reconsider the vote for another meeting. I go give them that. But to actually overturn that, I can't see that happening. And that should never happen. I'm asking you, town council, do they need a super? I believe they can't take a three to two vote and just turn this thing over. Mr. I don't, I don't see that happening. Yes. I, I, I don't think, uh, I think it's very problematic for town council to be giving legal advice in a public forum that's going to set the roadmap for whoever it is that appeals this decision to play forward. Um, 
you know, this question of supermajority or majority uh, is a question uh, that has been looked at, but uh, someone is going to wind up suing the town. It's just a question of who. And for us to be engaged in strategy in a public forum is ill-advised. Yes, Mr. Lowe. I, I would like to speak. Um, Mr. McCoy is correct. In my 14 plus years on the Board of Appeals, we never had a special accommodation. I have one simple question, Mr. Chairman, to the Town Council. What is a special accommodation? And I would like to get Suzanne's question answered because she has a, it's a great dilemma for the Town Council. If the Board already denied the special permit and then they undeny it with this special accommodation, whatever that is, I'd love to know what that is. I can't find it anywhere in the little research at the time that I had to research it, but it, it needs to be answered. It does, and not that we can, like you said, Mark, we can't direct the Board of Appeals what to do, but for the general public to know what a special accommodation is and what their town, what their council's trying to, for lack of a better word, pull over the wall of our eyes, um, I, I would want to know. I, I would want to know as a selectman in town or just a person in the, in the seat over there, what is a special accommodation and, and to Mr. McCoy's argument, and I agree with him, it, it should be a super, it should be a, a major, not, a, not a simple majority. Because that's what it seems like, that's what this seems to be going. So if, if you can answer, if, if it's possible to answer what a special accommodation is, I, I'd appreciate it. Yes. I mean, through you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, we're actually talking about a reasonable accommodation, not a special accommodation. Okay. Uh, it, it's it's found in the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it is an effort by uh, by this entity to use the the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act to essentially um, <coughs> override, so to speak, the town's own zoning. Um, I've never seen it done. I've ne I I know uh, I I don't believe. Um, the town of Wilmington has ever done this. I think that's been uh, researched, but I, 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 the, I know that question was asked at the last meeting, and I didn't expect the research to uh, be anything. What I've been, I've been uh, practicing municipal law now for uh, over 30 years. Um, I've, I have not seen the ADA applied to uh, zoning actions. Um, the case law is not clear on this because it's something that, that's, that's very rare. And uh, it's not, a, again, uh, to pick up on, on what the town manager said, we're, the concern is that we, we're, we're discussing legal strategy as it may impact litigation right. involving the zoning. I, I don't want you to do that. And I'm, I'm very hesitant to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very right. hesitant to give you know, a legal ruling on this issue other yeah. than to say you know, the, the case law is, is somewhat unclear. Um, the clearest case we could find uh, points to the applicability of the, the, the governance of the zoning board itself. Which, uh, which, uh, and we're not talking about we're not talking about reconsideration, and we're not talking about overriding the decision on the special permit. That's that's essentially done. We're talking about a an effort to obtain a reasonable accommodation, which would essentially bypass the the, the existing zoning. It's it's a, it's essentially a, a separate decision that's that's being sought, and the the application of the law to that, um, it's again it, the 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 law does not specify how that is to be addressed. That being said, the law the the the, the case law seems to indicate that the governance of the zoning board would would apply. Um, I, I really don't want to say more than that because at the February meeting, it's, it's, it's February 27th, I believe, is when the next meeting is going to come up when that, when that issue will, will, will arise, and that's when the Zoning Board of Appeals will discuss that specific issue. But believe me, it, it, it will be looked at specifically under the, under the town's governance and uh, you know the the, the I, I would I would trust that the zoning board of appeals with uh, with council will make the best decision on behalf of the town. But it's it's certainly not a situ situation where it's a simple reconsideration. It's it's far more complicated than that. And it's it's the whether whether the application of the Americans with Disabilities Act would would be paramount. But again, um, at the end of the day, the the appeal that could happen it could, it could be an appeal from both decisions. So that's why. Uh, again, I'm not trying to avoid the question of what decision would be defended. Um, we, the town council's job is to defend the town, uh, and and the, the the appeal could very well be uh, from the the loss on the special permit and a 
a loss or a win uh, without prejudging because you know, I don't make the decision, the zoning board does, but the decision on the reasonable accommodation. There could easily be appeals on one or both of, of those decisions by one or more parties, and uh, the defense would be mounted with respect to the actions by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there someone else uh, that would like to speak in public comments? I mean, I uh, appreciate going back and forth. Ms. Sullivan, but thank you. I, but you I can come back to, to it. Yeah, Ms. Sullivan, yeah, sure. You can come back to it. I want to see if there's someone else that would like to speak. And then please come back to it. Yes, in the back. Rob Fasulo, 28 Marjorie Road. I've got a few questions um, to the, uh, the attorney just brought up. <laughs> if it's never been done before and there's nothing to base it on, uh, where will the process come from? Uh, who's going to create it? And what process is going to be followed to take this vote? I, did you have more questions? Yes, that? I do. That? But I, I want to give him, is he going to okay. answer or no? Mr. Chairman, the, the, the process would be governed by the law. Again, it would be an application under the Americans with Disabilities Act brought before the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals would, would hear that application and act upon it. Um, there's been some, some suggestion that the applicant would dictate the, the process, and that, that, that's not correct. Um, the, the applicant does not dictate the process. The process is dictated by the board that hears the decision, or hears the application. And so the matter would be before the, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals for consideration by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Yes. So, uh, so uh, the way I'm understanding it, I'm, and I'm not asking a question at this point, but it uh, mm. sounds like there's, since there's nothing, it's never, excuse me, never been done before, um, that they're going to be, somebody's just going to be creating this out of the wind. I, I, I would think it would be valuable to the public to know what that procedure is going to be ahead of time. Um, I'm glad that you guys are going to be talking about the rink because um, there are some questions that I have that I would hope that when you guys do talk about it that you're going to address. Um, my first question is who within the town was responsible for the town's interest um, in, in that, uh, in, in that uh, transaction? Um, and my question to Mr. Hull is, when did you find out about the sale? Um, and then I would hope that the person who was in charge of the rink purchase is not the person who's also negotiating for Sharapa Farm, because we still don't have a, we don't have a resolution as far as the farm goes. And I know that the last thing that we were hearing was there might be some negotiations. And I think that that person didn't do a very good job. Um, so I would hope that we would reconsider if that's the case. Uh, this, the other thing I wanted to bring up is on Friday, um, another notice of determination was issued to the town um, based on a separate request for documents on this 362 Middlesex. I'm not going to go into the whole particulars, but it is a very, it's a separate request um, that I have, that I, we have not received a thing on. Um, so my question to Mr. Hull is, are you, uh, is somebody going to actually uh, conform with the law and provide the documents that are, are being asked? I would, I would um, say, well, let's answer that, but hold off on the rink questions okay. for new business. For Certainly in terms of the uh, open, the, the multiple uh, requests for public records, the town has been very responsive. The challenge has been uh, that when responses have been issued, uh, they have been brought to the uh, supervisor of records. Uh, the supervisor of records has made uh, some determinations, uh, council. Uh, I know there, there's a particular desire to have certain attorney-client privileged communications. Uh, town council is of the opinion that uh, those uh, exchanges are, are in fact attorney-client privileged and not subject to release. We will continue to work through that, but to suggest that the town has not been responsive uh, is simply not true. There's been multiple exchanges between yourself and uh, Sharon George, uh, the town clerk, over the last several months, uh, and she has attempted to provide uh, the information when it's been uh, requested and in a timely manner. M Mr. Hull, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. You, you just <coughs> the the request for was for emails 
about 362 Middlesex that should have generated thousands of, of emails. I have got nothing. So f for you to sit here and, and, and look us in the eye and say that they're trying to be responsive to the requests is a, f I'm, I'm sorry, sir, you're, that's a flat out lie. Um, you haven't. I'm not you're, talking. So, so I'm not let me talking be, about the. Let me be clear. Not, you're you're I'm telling me that you have not received lawyer. any mail, emails at all from the town clerk. Is that I, what you're telling me? I have got zero emails. Z zero on the emails. December 16 request mm -hmm. that encompasses every department in this in this town. Zero. Zero. Yeah. I've gotten a bunch from the first one, which was November 28th, and the only matter of contention in there is the format that was used by the town to claim attorney-client privilege on specific 10. That's a completely separate matter. On the December 16th request, which requested emails from all other departments, nothing has been turned over. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mr. Bendel. If I could, just to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to go on record as saying that uh, I, too, was subject to the request, and uh, I have complied with uh, the request and handed over uh, everything that I have in terms of uh, my personal email, my text message, and my social media activity, which was part of the request, and I have complied with that request. So I have uh, forwarded that over to the manager. That was not part of the request. Oh. Mr. I don't know who made the request. I know that someone a request was passed along to us about a week and a half ago. Um, and I went through my text messages, email, personal email, uh, personal Facebook account, uh, my Selectman Facebook account. Um, I, and I, we had, at that point, I think we had our Selectman email for two days, and that, there wasn't anything about it at that point. I turned over what I had to, to Mr. Hall. I, mean, I, I don't know, Mr. Fazil, if it was from you or for somebody else, because I don't remember yeah, if it request, mentioned. So okay. No, it was your request. Okay. Is there someone else? Yes. Frank West, to Berkshire Road. A uh, couple of questions that I had asked a couple of meetings that I'm not sure of the honesty, Kevin, if I, if I really got the answer, but I'll, I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll ask you again. Uh, one specific to the Roman House. I was thinking, and again, I heard in the manager's budget, it sounds like there, it sounds like the end game is to consider the building at some point in the future an obsolete building and potentially be taken down. But it sounds like for the next foreseeable future that the building is still going to remain, if not for the superintendent schools and the school department, the building itself will be there. So my, my comment or my question is, is that is there any way to talk to the superintendent of public buildings, have him give an assessment of the structure and cost and see if there's ways that some of the things at least make it look nicer. I mean, maybe it's as simple as maybe have some simple carpentry and have, you know, I know sometimes prisoners come in and, and do painting and, and small repairs that probably wouldn't cost the town a lot, but would make the building, you know, right in back of the brand new high school, right in front of the brand new high school, at least appear to be nicer than it is than it looks today. So that's one comment. Um, I don't know if you want to do one or two questions. I got four. Uh, uh, in regards to that, I remember you bringing up, uh, is there something that's going to be presented on the budget? to address the town hall and school administration building not i believe not this warrant and not this budget it doesn't address mm -hmm. uh but we have uh fixed the roof which i know it's not you people don't see how pretty the roof is but we put in uh what was it twenty four thousand dollars in roof repair right. uh because there are people that are working there and we want to make sure that it's um a place where they can they can work and excel um, so, right. uh, yeah, just, go ahead. just briefly, uh, it's a point well taken, Mr. West. Uh, it, it's, I think it's a, a building that there are parts of it that are really elegant, but it's in front of a brand new high school. It's kind of like the mustache on the Mona Lisa. It's just kind of, um, it looks out of place at this point. Uh, I have spoken to Mr. Hooper because I know that for a long time the town has made use of, uh, I think it's, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, it's not an inmate release program, but making use of local uh, inmates that uh, do a lot of painting. Uh, there is some hesitation to be putting them so close to a school. It, it at least limits it, um, because uh, certainly 
a lot of uh, parents would be very concerned if uh, inmates are showing up right next to a high school to do work. Um, I, I agree we have to do something with it. I would like to see the, um, the building perhaps, you know, sold and moved. Um, but I, I don't, there's nothing on next year's budget to do that. But I, I would like to see uh, something like that happen. Did you want to say something on the repair of the, from uh, the, the painting the, and to, upkeep? To this point, the, the roof was clearly the priority because we were having roof leaks. So as was noted, we need to make sure that uh, the people that are working in there, um, you know, have a reasonable place to work. Um, there is no uh, plan at this point to do any significant upgrades uh, to the building. I think there is, again, uh, the question of um, what the future of that building is. There's been a proposal, as, uh, as you know, for a combined uh, school town admin building. Um, whether that happens or not is an open question. I think there needs to be uh, some real, uh, a, a real uh, serious look at those buildings as well as uh, uh, others in town and uh, a determination as to which buildings we focus on first. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, it becomes a, um, a two-edged sword. On the one hand, you know, we, we spent $24,000 to repair the roof because it needed repair, and we got criticism for it. Why are you spending $24,000 on a building that, you know, should be torn down? Um, you know, you, you can't win. So, you know, if we spend significant money on the building, um, you know, one of the challenges in that building is it doesn't even have a, a septic system or it's, <clears throat> it's not tied to sewer. We have a, uh, essentially a, um, uh, a tank, uh, a tight tank, uh, that has to be pumped out every couple of weeks. Um, you know, if that building is going to be made to be a sustainable building, um, there's going to be some money that's going to have to be spent on uh, creating some, th some kind of a more sustainable system there. I mean, th those things are going to cost money. And I don't think there's been a real determination as to whether this is a building that should stay in that location or should be moved to another location. Yes. Oh. I just wanted to add yeah. part of the answer to the question, I hope, is that the building was looked at, too, as part of the facilities master plan, too. So a thorough review of the building was done recently. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have that to go forward to look at. My yeah, Mr. Was. My only comment on that is, is that if the Board of Selectmen directed the manager to have the, board, have the uh, building superintendent do an assessment of the building, this way here, this board would have an idea of what those costs are. And if there's things that, again, I'm, what I'm thinking of is initially some simple carpentry and a paint job, just to, just to make it look a lot nicer than it is. I mean, we, with respect, we have, we've lost several other buildings, notably the, the Swain and the Whitfield, because the town just let them rock. So all I'm saying is that there's no plan to move the people that are in that building out in the foreseeable future. There's no plan, plans to raise or move that building in the foreseeable future. Make it look a little bit nicer. That's, I, think that's, I don't think that's asking you too much. You had another question you mentioned? Yeah, the, uh, again, I got three other comments, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. The uh, uh, inclusionary zoning bylaw. I know we had uh, uh, Valerie come in, she gave her presentation. It's still in draft stages. The, the request actually was initiated from this board to do that uh, type of study. And I think that the selectmen should weigh into it, you know, specifically to the density, which they're talking right now is 15 percent <coughs> affordable housing. I, my, my personal belief is that I, I believe in hearing her, uh, hearing her presentation that that should be higher. I think also that, like they're saying, there should be eight it's for, uh, complexes that are eight uh, units and greater. It should be for zero, zero well, one unit and higher. Just you know, have it across the board. And I think uh, Ms. Sullivan made comments about the open space. So again, I just think it's something that where it was initiated from this board that this board should weigh in on, on how it's presented before it goes to town meeting. And the reason why I say that, or actually before it goes officially in the warrant, because once it goes to town meeting four, correct me if I'm wrong, the, you can amend the zoning article 
to make it less restrictive, but you cannot make it more restrictive. So in other words, today it's 15%. If, say, I wanted to make a motion to make it 25% affordable housing, it would probably get tossed out of the fact that it's more restrictive. And I, I probably do. You, Mr. Chairman, I think the town council could answer that. You have a response to that? Through you, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Uh, Chairman, obviously that's a discussion. It's ultimately the call of the uh, uh, the moderator as to what's within the scope. It would have to be a determination as to what was it within the scope of the article. Um, zoning zoning is tricky because of determination of what what was the warning to the voters and whether um, a change of that percentage would would be deemed uh, more restrictive or 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 less uh, depending on on the aspect you look at it. But uh, there is always the concern of of scope with respect to an article uh, with respect to zoning. I, and, and, and I'm figuring that Valerie was supposed to be coming back to the board uh, on that as well. I think that was mentioned at the last meeting. And two real quick was uh, one, for this uh, upcoming selection uh, election, will it be early voting? You're trying to maximize the amount of people that can vote or would like to cast a vote. Is, is there any thought, any thought been given to early voting? Not for this. No, election. not, no. I'm, we have not. I don't believe we've discussed that, at least for this election. But that, again, that might be something to consider for the future. So again, trying to maximize participation. Mr. McCoy saying that you know people don't want to come out in April, but they may come out in March. Well, you know what? If you give them a week, like I think early voting for the uh, state election this this past year, I think was uh, encouraged, and a lot of people took advantage. There of is absentee voting that right. allows them to do it ahead of time so I guess that's a little bit of an early vote if they want to consider that but and the other real quick is that you're looking at ways to, to speed up town meeting and uh, say that the moderator that he was talking about the possibility of combining certain uh warrants is it possible i'm just throwing it out there for warrants <coughs> such as the two that came to mind when when he said that were one warrant typically is we voted a certain amount for Veterans Day and Memorial Day observations. To me, it's, it's like $6,000. It sounds like that could be you know, put into either the Veterans Agents budget or some budget that um, wouldn't really necessarily have a discussion unless somebody wanted to bring it up under a line item in the budget. And the other one that comes to mind is I think we give at least $250 to one or two veterans halls for uh, better purposes, I think. Maybe that's another one that, you know, could get, unless a statute that prevents it, it could get thrown into a budget and maybe mention it as a line item, but eliminate it from that, you know, eliminate it from being a, a potential warrant, that, you know, uh, warrant number that might generate discussion. Just a couple of food for thought. Thank you. Is there someone else that wishes to speak? Yes, in the back. Uh, Jeff Wood, 18 Frederick Drive. So I don't think you've come anywhere close to answering the questions we all asked two weeks ago. So can we have a reading of the record from two weeks ago? Because there were specific questions we asked around the legality of how you uh, would have looked at the exposure level of this town. I know town council said there were certain things he couldn't answer or probably wouldn't answer because of any type of pending lawsuit that may happen. I fully respect that, but I want to understand the ones he's not going to answer. I guess we'd have to look at the, the prior the meetings and see which questions we were missing, unless you... I know there was a question yeah. raised uh, at the last meeting about uh, whether uh, the board had considered uh, the, quote, exposure, end quote, uh, of uh, reappointing Dan Veerman uh, to the Board of Appeals. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not aware of any consideration uh, given to any exposures. I, mean, I think that goes into this issue that people who are on boards and committees still have a First Amendment right to free speech. Uh, and the fact that Mr. Veerman has exercised his right to free speech uh, during his uh, period outside of the board meetings is, is something that, that neither the Board of Selectmen nor anyone uh, can restrict. That was one question. The other question was 
what was the vote uh, at, uh, to reappoint uh, Mr. Veerman. The vote was four in favor. Uh, one person, Mr. McCoy, Selectman McCoy, was not present. Okay, so I appreciate those uh, answers. So when Mr. Kyra said, I think we've answered all the uh, questions, you, you answered the two. I definitely wanted to have, so you knew those two hadn't been answered. Why didn't you speak up? Why did I have to ask that question? Yeah. I'm asking him why he didn't speak up when Mr. Kyrus said the questions were done. Well, I, I apologize. I didn't uh, realize that we missed that, that question. Okay. Um, but it's been All answered right. now. Yep. yep. And so based on the free speech, I, I'll, uh, I'll extrapolate and say that you must be supporting the Virginia governor. Uh, so anyway, the... Uh, I don't understand where that's coming from, Mr. Well, Wood, but that's a little out of line. So the... Uh, so of course... I'm looking at everybody. You know what I'm coming for. I was away last week, but I watched the tape from the uh, presentation. So I still believe, as I've said for many meetings and also brought up at the annual town meeting, that the town is woefully underfunding both the OPEB liability and the retirement fund. So I want to start with the retirement fund, which, going back to your presentation from a year ago, the pension, we, you put $1 million towards, at that time, a pension of uh, or I'm sorry, of a retirement fund of $78.6 million, and I'm rounding it up. Uh, this year, you want to put $1.5 million towards $84.993 million. So the retirement fund has gone up $8 million after you put a $1 million into it. And you have to have it paid off by 2035. So the basic math for $84,999,500 over the next 16 years if it was just we were going to count what we have today, is $5.3 million a year. So I'd like to understand how you expect to even reach that amount based on what it is this year. And you know it's going to grow. So it grew almost $8 million in a year. So where is the town going? You have all this free cash. You've made all these commitments to town employees over the years. You told them they could have great plans. You signed them off. Now you've gone back, from what I understand, you're renegotiating with them. It's totally unfair to them. <clears throat> Start funding it. You have free cash. Start funding this appropriately. I've gone back. I've done all kinds of research. You guys know it. The town of West Newbury started doing this in 2003. Their director of finance was pounding on tables, according to many people that you can read about in the papers, stating we can't afford this going forward. You didn't have to disclose this until, until 2017, and you didn't. When you go back and you take a look at your presentation from 2018, all you said was you were contributing $1 million to OPEP, but you never told in that presentation, you never said how much we had built up at that point. And the same thing with retirement. So in those last two presentations, FY 2019 and FY now 2020, it is growing out of control. But especially with the retirement fund, you've got to pay this off by 2035. So based on the Mass Municipal Association organization that you all belong to, or you said you went to some of their meetings, they are pounding the table. It's easy to find those presentations on their website. They're saying it's out of control and that it's going to affect, seriously affect, and I'm reading directly from a quote from the executive director back in November 2018, a letter he put out to all towns, saying it's going to have a major effect on municipal and school budgets, crowding out essential services for taxpayers and jobs of existing and future employees. So you want to hire firemen? You want to hire policemen? Are you going to tell these new people you're hiring that most likely in five years will run out of money and you're going to lay them off? This has to be addressed. It is being addressed, sir, and I would suggest to you that the number of communities that are prepaying uh, towards their pension is probably less than a dozen. We're not only putting money aside into a stabilization account to uh, address those years when we get a spike in our uh, retirement assessment, we're prepaying. There are very few communities that are doing that. Are we paying 20 or 30 million dollars a year? No, because that voluminous free cash that everybody taps into is the money that at some point is going to have to be used to replace the Wildwood School, to replace 
any number of other buildings that, as I noted in my presentation, are 60 years plus old. I mean, we, th that, that is a significant amount of money. There's no question. But to, to take all of that money and to put it into the pension liability does not, is, is ill-advised. There, there needs to be a balanced approach. The reti Middlesex retirement system, as is the case with every retirement system in the Commonwealth, is in, a, in is part of the assessment that we get every year. A portion of that assessment is based upon their best judgment as to how we can retire that debt by 2035. So we already have built in to that $545,000 increase in our assessment this year an amount that's supposed to pay down that liability. So we're saying in addition to meeting that obligation and paying that assessment, we're going above and beyond that. Uh, is it going to be easy? It, it isn't going to be easy, but to suggest that we should spend 10 or $15 million from the free cash to pay down that debt. So then what happens when we need to replace the Wildwood School? We need to replace the Woburn Street School. We need to replace the Senior Center. Where's that money going to come from? Right, but this is current debt you have that you said you would do for the employees of this town, and I think we owe it to them. So and if we, we have to we, delay those buildings for a couple of more years so that we make sure that this is paid correctly, I think that should be the number one priority. We, uh, we, are, we are meeting the obligation, and I would say uh, doing the best job we can given all the other constraints that we have. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not in the, uh, I'm not recommending that we defer for another 10 or 20 or 30 years uh, the replacement of the senior center or uh, the replacement of some of these other schools uh, that have served the town well for 50 plus, 60 plus years. I agree. Based on the presentation, I think they have served it well. But can you explain to me how, how did the retirement fund go up from 78.6 to 84.99 if we're being advised what to do? I mean, it, it's clearly way out of the realm of what you're paying. I, I can't speak speak to the specifics of Wilmington's increase. I do know some of the underlying factors are uh, that the uh, uh, return on investment, which the retirement system, you know, that money that goes to the retirement system uh, is invested and, uh, you know, the uh, investments uh, to some measure dictate uh, the amount that uh, the towns, not only Wilmington, but all the other towns owe when there are, uh, if, if their projected uh, rates of return uh, exceed the real rate of return, then we're in a positive situation. If they fall short of the rate of a real rate of return, uh, then we're in a uh, difficult position. And, you know, to the extent that there are new hires, uh, that also uh, contributes to some measure. You know, the challenge becomes when you have service demands, do you just say, we're not going to hire anybody for the next 10 years until we can retire this debt? I, I don't think that's uh, responsible either. There are certainly service needs in this community. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the overtime on the fire side, uh, and certainly the Finance Committee has picked up on that and is very focused on that as they should be. We need to start addressing that. So. I believe it's uh, responsible to add additional fire and police personnel, notwithstanding the fact that it will have an effect on our retirement liability. Okay, so you have to pay off $85 million essentially in the next 16 years. What's the, what's the plan that you have going forward to do that? The, the plan is to continue to put additional money above and beyond what the uh, retirement system is telling us to. The, the vast majority of uh, communities in Middlesex retirement are simply paying their annual assessment, which in our case is over $7 million. And that's what they're doing. And their expectation is based upon what they're being told by the re retirement system, if they continue on that payment schedule, they will retire their pension liability by 2035. 35. I'm saying that's not good enough. In addition to that payment, we're going to make a prepayment and, and accelerate that. Uh, but I, I can't see, you know, looking at a global situation here where we've got so many other demands on the town's resources, I just don't believe 
it is advisable to, to be spending five, ten, fifteen million dollars focused on that one issue. That's I, I just I don't think that is advisable. Well, I, I, I foresee that you're, you're going to come back to the taxpayers at some point and say we're going to have to do a prop two and a half override because we're so out of there's no way we can meet this. I, I don't see how you can meet it, right? So don't. If you come back with a Prop 2 and a half override, that's going to be a great annual town meeting because I'm going to get up with all the times I've brought this up and all the things I addressed, and we'll have all of these transcripts of what you and I discussed back and forth, and we'll see where it goes, right? But mm -hmm. simple math is telling me you're not going to make that number. And it, it very well could be that the retirement system decides that uh, they're going to move that date from 2035 to 2040. The state has set a deadline of... Uh, every uh, retirement system having their pension liability retired by 2040, uh, Middlesex Retirement System has decided to be more aggressive and make it 2035. And this is not unique to Wilmington. Uh, you know, communities across the Commonwealth are all confronting the same issue. I quite honestly wouldn't even be surprised if by 2040 the legislature, realizing that cities and towns cannot afford to retire the debt, uh, pushes that date out. But you know that's and, and that's typically what happens, and, and that's across the Commonwealth. Right. Uh, valuations are done every two years. They're looked at by actuaries, and then they're they're structured so that uh, you pay off that debt within a certain time period. And if not, they keep moving it out. Believe it or not, that's what right. the state's solution is: right. is to move it out. I, I agree, and I I think they have been doing that. But they're also now talking about the fact that they're going to put a date on OPEP because it's so out of control. So the, the state of Massachusetts is at 15.6 billion, right? And, and this town's very fortunate that we're putting money into OPEB, uh, where many towns across the Commonwealth are not. They're not even paying attention to it at okay, this point in time. The S&P came back to you last June and said, you don't have a plan. So well, I don't I know what they're going to say to you this time, right? Them. Okay. Let's say you disagree, right? Yeah. But they're the rating agency, which is going to yeah. affect our loan, right, our debts. Well, the fact, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, the, the, I think the most significant element of why the town has not been able to get a, uh, an increase in its bond rating from AA+, plus, which I think is a pretty darn good rate in and of itself, to AAA, is because of the demographics of the community. We're not an Andover, we're not a Weston, we're not a Sudbury. Um, those, that also factors in, they look at the income, the average income of residents and they look at the values in those communities and that plays into it. Um, so, you know, we, I think we will continue to pursue being a triple A community, um, but, you know, that, that is a, a challenge that we face. My concern from the S&P rating I mean, Reading, for it's example. Drop mm -hmm. from AA plus back to double A or something, right? I mean, that's, that's the fear of it, but I know I'm way over my five minutes. I just want to say I, I appreciate you um, listening, and, and I really appreciate the back and forth instead of just writing questions down and answering it later. Uh, I just personally want to thank Mr. Loud. Uh, you have been a phenomenal supporter of many things. Um, I hate to say as a person, I really wasn't that involved in this town until about 18 or 19 months ago, but in that time frame, you have been an awesome supporter. Mm -hmm. And I really, really appreciate everything you've done, and I wish you the best of luck on uh, what you're going to do professionally. Thank you. Um, and you certainly were great with me anytime you saw me publicly and would obviously discuss a lot of things. And you never said you had anything else to do. I'm sure your wife was like, where did he go? <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, I got more comments later, so I think, thank you, Mr. <laughs> but thank you very much. And uh, just so you know, you're one of the ones I, I thought of when I wrote down, stop me at Eli's, because I saw you a couple of times there, so thank you. I saw you hide behind the bread rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone else that we should speak in public comments? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Janet Sawyer, 58 Lawrence Street. Um, going back to the reasonable accommodations um, comments, the letter that you received on January 22nd that went to the board, Mr. Hall, and the zoning board, um, numbers eight and nine, which had, you know weren't discussed at all um, since then, was about the reasonable accommodations and us asking uh, you, town council, and the zoning board to not even consider making any reasonable accommodations at this time because of the land court case and because that there is no system for reasonable accommodations set up in, 
in town. And, um, you know, I, I guess I think it, it's important that, you know, it wasn't discussed or addressed in any way, even though this let, it's all part of this letter from January 22nd. And <coughs> also in the letter, again, with Mr. Veerman, in the letter, because this is when it is requested that you consider his conflict of interest, it specifically says that it's brought up again in light of whether his uh, filling out the, the forms uh, is going to hold in a federal setting where we're talking about ADA special accommodations. And if it becomes a liability to the town in terms of his conflict, like what we perceive as a conflict of interest on that level. Not on the state level, but if this goes further, and like you, like you said, chances are you're going to be sued by somebody, it's just who. And so we were specifically asking in this letter that it be looked at in that light, um, which hasn't been commented on. Um, and whether or not the Zoning Board of Appeals should delay even considering it until the land court decision is done. I mean, is it, it would give the town time to look into a process and what other towns do in terms of um, reasonable accommodation. Um, the other thing that I wanted, just, um, I'm curious, is, um, is there a particular reason why this meeting is not being televised? Or is it? This meeting? Yeah. Oh, is it? There's somebody back there? Oh. <laughs> I came in and didn't see anybody. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so, you know, I think that's okay. Well, the, just to before you do, I, I believe at least part of what you are asking uh, has to do with uh, Mr. Veerman, um, consistent with my comments earlier tonight. Um, and then two weeks ago, I, I, I think it would probably be best practice to recuse myself for the, the, the duration of this discussion so as to not uh, appear um, on something on which I'm, uh, I have a conflict. So I ask you guys to retrieve me um, from the town manager's office. So, sorry. I guess to the points that were raised um, in terms of um, dealing with the Board of Appeals. Again, as was noted earlier by Town Council, um, the Board of Appeals is a separate and distinct body that has authority over um, making zoning changes. The only nexus or the, no the only connection really between the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Appeals is that the Board of Selectmen appoint the members of the Board of Appeals, but the Board of Selectmen cannot reach in and dictate what the Board of Appeals does in terms of decisions that they consider or how they approach uh, certain, uh, certain cases. Certainly Town Council has and will continue to advise the Board of Appeals in terms of um, uh, this case at 362 Middlesex, uh, but it, it, I, I can't overemphasize the fact that you know, there seems to be this appeal to the Board of Selectmen as if the Board of Selectmen can just dictate what the Board of Appeals does, and that just isn't the way um, the, this, this system is set up. So these questions would better be, I mean, they got the letter as well on January 22nd, so take it up at their meeting on Wednesday? They have a meeting Wednesday? Uh, they do. Um, I mean, I certainly, you can presented at that time, I just want to make it very clear that that they are an independent body. They're, you know, they're governed uh, uh, by certain state laws and, and they're separate and distinct from the Board of Selectmen, except for the fact that the Board of Selectmen appoint them. Yes, so I think at the Board of Appeals you can ask them to read that letter into record. If they don't already do it on their own, they probably should read it better because it's a very informative letter. Very informative letter. Um, there's these in case law in there, so that was very informative to me when I read it, and it should be to them too. So they, 
you do have the right to ask them to read that. If they don't read it into the record, you do have the right to ask them to read it into the record. Thank you. There's someone else who wishes to speak. Yes. Painfully brief. Um, just Mike Shampoo. Yeah. You are never right. brief. Um, back about a year ago, uh, when I sat on this board, um, Frank, you know, um, the Romans, real quickly. Uh, I had reached out to, believe it or not, the people from uh, w, uh, from this old house, the television show, and I thought, what the hell? Let's see if maybe they're interested. Yeah. And I loved the idea of the town maybe negotiating with them for a very small fee, maybe even a buck to come in and buy the Roman house and move it and do it as part of their show. Um, no one ever got that. I'm bummed about that, but I was just going to say, maybe someone listening has some connection to WGBH or this old house, so I don't know if you guys are receptive to that idea, but if we were able to make something like that happen, I'd love for you to be receptive to that idea, so maybe we can work together as a team. Um, with regards to the rink not being negotiated on, that really frustrated me tonight, and I don't want to... I was part of some discussions where it was executive session stuff, so I don't want to step in, in a landmine here, but I can just simply summarize it by saying that all along the way, from the very, very infancy of conversations, and that's all it could ever be, uh, we never were in any agreement with the owner of the rink. There was a, a verbal discussion about the potential, maybe, for us to someday buy the rink at a certain price. Um, and then that owner decided to go and do something else. Um, not for lack of effort by people on this, on this board or in the town. Uh, I would say with an exhaustive amount of efforts being made by people on this board and by people in town hall to try to continue to keep those dialogue, that, that dialogue open and those conversations alive. Irrespective of all those efforts, the conversations died and the owner decided to go in his own path. Uh, and that's not a failure of negotiation on, on the part of the town. I want to make sure that gets echoed very, very clearly. The only person that failed here was, I dare say, the owner of that ring. Um, and Mr. Loud, I want to just end my comments with, uh, it was an honor and a privilege to serve with you for the years that I did. Uh, you are a tremendous public servant for the years that you spent on the uh, Zone Board of Appeals uh, and for you, the years that you spent here. Uh, the town is better for your service, uh, and we will be uh, less good uh, in, the, in the absence of it. Uh, but I thank you so much, sir. I'm glad to call you a friend, and I wish you all the best. Thank you, thank you, sir. Does anyone else wish to speak before? Yes. Um, yes. Um, you know, just procedurally, I was wondering. If you could just state your name and. Oh, sorry. Kelly Richard, Sherry Moon, Shady Moon Drive. So I was wondering procedurally, all of the papers that you were pushing at the beginning, how do you determine which ones get right into the record and which ones don't? Uh, the, the, the uh, papers that get written into the record are what is posted on the agenda. I mean, I've got notes that I take in terms of uh, different issues that I anticipate may be raised. Okay. So the, the pink letter that you uh, there was a, a memo. It was about saying, you know, that you were happy about the people serving on different boards and the efforts. That oh, uh, that is that the conflict? Yeah, that was the uh, reference to. Um, uh, there was a reference of one of the past. That was the uh, selectman's meeting where someone uh, accused someone on the zoning board of appeals to have a conflict of interest. Right. So this this letter, as a as a result of that allegation that was made at a prior meeting, mm -hmm. uh, in consultation with town council, uh, it was determined that the best way to try to address that, since again conflict, mm -hmm. the potential of conflict is really an issue that individuals have to deal with and seek out mm -hmm. counsel from the ethics commission. Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 determination was made to send this memo to each member of the Board of Appeals uh, to remind them of their responsibilities, also while appreciating the fact that they're doing this work for free, essentially, uh, and to remind them of their obligations to, um, you know, in the event that they have a conflict, to contact the Ethics Commission. Uh, that was the purpose of that. Okay. And then, like, for example, if a letter is sent to the Board of Selection prior to the meeting, 
and the person asks for it to be read into the record, are there rules around that? You know, would that, uh, would that get read into the record, or do you have to do something extra special when you submit a letter to get it read into the record for the public to hear about it? No, I mean, so some of the other ones that came in, there were certainly two that addressed uh, 368, and I won't, uh, 362, I won't go any further, but um, uh, those letters were provided to the Board of Selectmen, and I didn't think it was necessary to read, you know, four or five pages of um, material into the record. Okay. I mean, they're, they're, the Board has them, they understand what they say, and... Well, so those, those people are, are following at home, and... So yeah. those, those are delivered to our house on Friday nights. So all of the, the letters that are submitted that are on the agenda are, are delivered to us. So we, we do get them and we do read them. Okay. So. And then my one last point is that, you know, obvious, I believe that people serve their towns with the best of intentions. I mean, it's an unpaid position. And so when you all spend a lot of time doing that, you live here, you see all the people in town. So. I just take that as a matter of fact. Um, the difficult piece for me as this process has unfolded is that, you know, within our group, if we've asked questions, sometimes those questions haven't been answered. And that's where, you know, trust erodes. And I mean, for me, I honestly want to feel like people are looking out for me, like the people that are elected officials are looking out for me and concerned. I mean, Jonathan, I think a lot of people do feel angered by the opioid epidemic. It's certainly concerning across the board. It's, it, it's devastating. Any family that deals with addiction, I know that firsthand, it is a devastating thing to deal with. Throughout this, I wasn't ever gonna mention this publicly, but there have been some of us on the Concerned Citizens of Wilmington, our homes have been vandalized. We've had threatenings threatening things said to us online. People have suggested to do terrible things to the people in our neighborhood, to the people who have spoken out. And, um, you know, we are all here in this country and we have the same rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the Bill of Rights pr protects us all. For most of us, you know, a lot of the value that we have um, for, you know, some people have suggested life over property values. That's, that's all well and good, except that most people have most of their finances tied up into the value of their homes, and the lives that they need to take care of are their young children or elderly parents that are getting older and might need help, or whatever, medical expenses um, in our own families. Of course we care about people affected by this. Of course we do. It's crazy. I mean, we also have fears that the drugs are so strong nowadays that what if I'm walking my dog and somehow my dog licks something and passes away? I mean, my cat disappeared three years ago. Do you know that it was devastating for my daughter for two years because our cat was with her every single night when she went to bed? So we have a heart. Everyone has a heart. The, the thing that makes a community great is that there's mutual caring back and forth and expressed and things are not hidden from us because typically when things are hidden it makes people feel like there's a lack of honesty and candor and nobody wants to feel like that about their elected officials and we all want to feel like we care about each other mutually. So that's all I have to say about that. I mean I hope that people think about that, express that, and have consideration on both sides. Because a lot of people are hurting in the world, and you know, I guess kindness matters. Thank you. Is there, before I go back to, is there anybody else that wishes to speak first time? Oh, okay, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dan Sullivan. Well said, Kelly, by the way. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I just want to circle back and, you know, beat that, you know, beat the drums again about what the original request was to this board, and it kind of builds a little bit, actually, on what Kelly said about defending the bylaws of the town, why I said that. 
I mean, you heard from council tonight that the purpose of this accommodation is to go around the bylaws of this town. And whatever the vote is of the ZBA, we don't know what it's going to be. But I'm saying, I'm speculating, if it were a vote to do just that, then I would expect, and I think a lot of people in this town would expect this town to take, this board to take action. And that's why I said it uh, last week, that's why I said it the week before. If that vote comes forward and it, it's a three to two vote to, for the accommodation to go around our bylaws, we want you guys to put your, that put your hand up, take the oath, to protect the special permit vote. And I, I still haven't gotten any like affirmatives yet, whether or not this board would do that. And I don't know, maybe that's strategy or something and you can't do that. But that's what we're expecting from this board. And we're gonna know, I guess, by February 27th because we're gonna march ourselves back into this meeting. And if it's a, that accommodation takes place and demand that you take action, because that's your job. You know, is to protect that special permit vote. We believe that the accommodation vote is an illegal vote, that there's no precedent for it. We actually have information that we've gathered ourselves that says that that's the case, that it was never the purpose of the ADA to place buildings in zoning districts. It does not place buildings. It doesn't require setbacks from sidelines. Um, it doesn't, that's not what the purpose of the ADA is, is to accommodate people with handicaps and in existing situations. It's not supposed to decide whether a building can or cannot go up because every single medical facility would not have to follow zoning. And that's the precedent that's, that, that's being tried to be set here by the applicant's attorney. That any medical facility, because every medical facility has handicapped people, and that, that, that you could turn around and say you don't have to, to meet zoning. So once again, I'm gonna ask the board to please, all right, answer that question. And if you can't answer that question, to please take it into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rich, did you have anything to add? Just again, briefly, I think the, the issues that are being touched on are certainly issues of litigation strategy. Um, so I, I don't think it would be appropriate to answer. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, a position has been made and a request made of the Board of Selectmen, but ultimately, the, the, as we've said numerous times, the Zoning Board of Appeals is an independent body um, governed by uh, statute and, and uh, uh, case law, and you know, they, they, that board will undertake its duty, and then uh, the matter would be subject to review based upon whatever, whatever challenge is made to the decision of the uh, of the zoning board, but uh, at this time to discuss litigation strategy would not be appropriate. Yes, Mr. McCoy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to piggyback uh, what town council said earlier. You know, I'm really glad to hear the town council state that he's never seen the ADA law apply to zoning, and that's exactly what this is. We all heard this simply, the applicant's attorney, uh, he brought this up, and he's just simply, he's just a hired gun. And of course he's gonna say that. And I would just hope to think that the Board of Appeals look at that, and uh, which is important. And I think, and I'm gonna say this, I think Mr. Syracuse really hit the nail on the head. When he sat down and said, can you reduce the size of the building? Applicant said no. Can you reduce the beds? Applicant said no, because he said, I'd be willing to vote for it if you could make some accommodations relative to the size of the building. And the applicant said no. And Mr. Syracuse, I think, hit the nail on the head, and I'll say it again, is when he voted against that, he voted against the aesthetics of the, the building, and it's not harmonious to that area. Plain and simple. And he kept it at a zoning, and that's all it is. And to answer your question, uh, Ms. Sullivan, I would hope that the Board of Appeals does do the right thing. I respect their opinion. They're their own entity, but however, you know, I would take action to make sure that with towns protected, because once again, that lawyer is nothing but a hired gun. It sounds like he's trying to pass a Hail Mary, and hopefully that the Board of Appeals accept that, and I don't buy it. I don't buy it. He's a hired gun, plain and simple. Thank you. Mr. Rich. Just for a brief clarification, uh, I, I, I shouldn't say that I've, I've never seen the ADA applied to any 
zoning at all. I, it was with respect to a special permit, as as in this circumstance. So obviously the ADA does apply mm -hmm. in, in in a number of circumstances, but uh, but in this situation, um, I, this is not something that I that I've seen other towns um, decide on. It it is something that uh, obviously would be in the within the purview of the zoning board of appeals. And then once that once the zoning board of appeals makes its decision, there would be a discussion with that board, and then ultimately with this board as to the meaning of that decision and. Uh, um, how, to, how to proceed in that regard. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Palmer. This board is autonomous and they make that decision. Maybe they should hire their own lawyer. Mr. Wood. Uh, right. So just to follow up on what Suzanne was saying um, and for clarification for myself. So the regularly scheduled Zoning Board of Appeals meeting is February 13th, is, it, is that correct? That, that's when they were going to come back and finalize the vote, isn't that? They, they were scheduled. Meeting. That's the typical meeting, right. Yes. So who agreed to have the meeting on February 27th? So that this was a request by uh, the uh, Bettering's lawyer, yes. Yes. and our Zoning Board of Appeals agreed to have a yes. meeting because they wanted it. Yeah. So I'd like to know when we've done that before. We, we, we did it all the time on the Board of Appeals. Okay. All the time. All right. Uh, on every 40B that the town did, Yep. We, when there was additional meetings needed, which there was on this case, we would talk to the, the applicant and say, okay, and, and the members of the board, okay, we can't do February 13th. Can we do the 17th? Nope, but we can do the 27th. Can the board do the 27th? Yep. That is agreed upon. Okay, so it happens. Regular, it happens on every, every. Okay, and then yeah. within a week, two weeks, you would have other meetings. Yes. Okay. All right. So. That's so it happened, happened all the time. Okay. On the zoning board of appeals. All right, and I, I know the town council has already answered this question that this has never happened before. In, in Wilmington. In Wilmington. The, the question was raised. Just to jump in here for a second, the question was raised as to whether this type of circumstance, where uh, the Board of Appeals was asked to rule on a accommodations request, has ever happened in the town of Wilmington. Uh, I certainly don't recall any uh, circumstance in the past. I uh, queried the uh, building inspector and the uh, planning director. No one in the town clerk. No one seems to recall this uh, situation happening in uh, pr uh, prior to this one. I thought the town so council said the ADA I, applied uh, to zoning. Well, no. Applied to zoning. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. So just so I'm clear, right, so sorry. the accommodations request has never been done to anybody's knowledge within the town of Wilmington. Not, not that we're aware of. No. Right. Right. And the so only reason I bring that, so like, how did you know about it? Who, who did bring this up? Their lawyer. Yeah. Okay, so their lawyer, their lawyers brought this up as the, the request to do this. Yes. Because I really feel when you go back and you take a look at what the Zoning Board of Appeals has rejected in the past, uh, Mr. Berman was involved when the town carnival was going to be moved back to where the 4th of July building is. He wouldn't vote on that. He had some draconian things that he wanted put in, like $5,000 a day bonds and stuff, uh, which nobody would go with. You guys jumped through hoops to make it happen, to move that carnival back to where it was, to where it is today, right? So if you knew about this accommodation thing, you could have easily have done it. Mr. Lau didn't have to go through the ethics committee to get himself back on so he could vote for it. So it's like, if there was ever a time for you to have done it, which was right for the town, it would have been then, and you didn't do it. So the fact is that we're now hearing today, this has all come about because uh, the plaintiff, or whatever, you know, Bobrowski knew about this and he's asked for it. Seems, well, pre seems pretty far-fetched, right? Uh, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm lost. W what are you suggesting? Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that if this was such a good way to get around certain votes um, when they were needed, you would have done it for the carnival, right? You needed a four, you needed a four, you needed a supermajority vote for to get the carnival back to where it is today. Right. You didn't have it because Mr. Loud had to excuse himself because he was involved with something, and Mr. Berman wouldn't do it. He, uh, I believe he also recused himself. You, you couldn't even get to a supermajority based on what was going on with that. I believe what happened, I wasn't on the board at the time, but it was for the carnival, it was actually a different petitioner. It was a town becoming the petitioner uh, and having a substantially different proposal. 
That, well, right. that's how it that's how it ended up. That's how you got back around to it, so you could get the supermajority vote. But that's not how it started. So anyway, so you've answered the question. So the, uh, Bobrowski's the one who knew about this, and that's why it's going in. It's, it's a legal theory that he's pursuing, but I think his town council has, has stated it, it's an un, it's an unsettled area of law. This is a a, uh, a novel theory that he is. Um, trying to pursue to um, apply the ADA to to this specific type of proposal. So it, there's, it's not sure, we, we can't just look to one case and say, well, this says that the town wins or this says that the town loses. It's kind of, well. I agree, so what, so based on that, how, how can they even have the meeting? The zoning board does not even know how to vote, right? So there's no case law on a single, a simple majority versus a super majority. Well, so why would, really why would, why would town council, why would you agree to move forward with this? You're really, it, you're on legal ground. You don't even know. So the, there's plenty of areas that, of law that are unsettled and that somebody has to decide because there's a, a, either a petition or a conflict. So the Zoning Board of Appeals exists to try and resolve these types of issues. And if the petitioner doesn't like it or if somebody else doesn't like it, it can get appealed. And it's judge, and then if a right. judge makes a decision, and if someone's not happy with it, it goes up the ladder. I agree. So, but you don't the, go again back to the zoning board of appeals. So they're they're sitting in a squishy area for the law. They don't even know how to vote, right? I, I think if there's anything, I think we have kind of an appreciation as to the position that our volunteer members of the zoning board of appeals are in, because there's not something that says. Well, in this situation, I have to vote this way. In this situation, I have to vote that way. There's a reason why the vote wasn't five to nothing, one way or the other. Reasonable minds can differ. Okay. okay. So Thank there's you. a reason it voted 4-1. I mean, 3-2, which didn't get it in. But we're all sitting here. None of us, it doesn't seem like, knows what's going to happen. So I just don't understand how you can, ha how you can go forward. I don't, I don't tell council can't answer this question, but... <coughs> Within your executive session, how could you possibly have the meeting on February 27th? You don't know what the simple majority vote means. I'm done. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Yes, Mr. Sorry, Wood. Just a quick comment. Uh, Mr. Loud mentioned that the Board of Appeals could have asked, somebody could ask that a letter be written into the record. Uh, and I can tell you that, and I think these people can verify that. There have been letters that were asked that be read into the record and were refused by the chairman mm -hmm. to yeah. be read into yes. the record and also refused to have the person who wrote the letter read the letter into the record. And one other comment on the, this whole ADA thing is maybe the advice of town council to the zoning and board of appeals could be when they have their meeting on that day is this is a topic that can't be voted on, and maybe the town council, through the through, through the chairman, through the advice of town council, may in fact toss it out. They say this is something that we're not prepared to vote for, nor are we prepared to discuss, based on the fact that, as as you're saying, Mr. Street and, and others in town council, that it is kind of a sketchy point of law, and if that happens, then obviously the applicant may. You know, go with other options for a lawsuit to for whatever, but you know, maybe the advice of council can be we we choose not to discuss ADA in reference to a vote of a super majority that decided based on the size of a building in a particular area. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, just a simple question, like, that, that meeting the 27th, if it goes 3 to 2 like they voted the last time, and it goes uh, for the applicant, it goes 3 to 2, what happens that night, that, you know, like, that day, what happens? Well, you know, what's the next step? I mean, like that, how is that meeting going to start, the Board of Appeals meeting? What happens? You need to ask the Board of Appeals. Yeah, I don't, yeah. You guys can't answer they're that. They're going to be running So that what happens if they meeting. vote that night at 3 to 2 in, in favor of the applicant? What happens? What, what, what I was suggest. What I was going to happen. What I was suggest. How do we not know what's? I mean, so we, what, what, what do we? Nobody knows what, what happens with it. 
they poke three two. We just all sit here like a bunch of no, freaking dummies. No, a decision no, will no. get drafted. A decision will get drafted, and that similar to what is happening in the case of the decision that was made on the 16th. So, in that instance, uh, a town council, uh, Jonathan Silverstein, has um, based upon uh, I uh, information he has uh, received uh, from that meeting, he has. Uh, prepared a draft uh, decision for the board to consider. They were originally uh, uh, looking to consider that decision on the 13th. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Silverstein uh, is not available to attend that meeting, so that uh, consideration of that draft decision is being deferred, as I understand, until the 27th. But I, I, I would expect that whatever decision is made on the 27th, uh, a draft decision will be prepared by council, reviewed by the Board of Appeals, and, and ultimately signed off on. What does that mean? Can I, that decision can is I signed. Joe Ribeiro, to Judith Road. Okay. I, I don't know what that means. I mean, you know, if you could just simplify it, like. Mr. Chairman, can I, can I help? Yes. In past experiences on the Board of Appeals, and I'll go to a 40B because I was part of every 40B that's been in this town except for the Regency, uh, except for um, the Avalons, okay? And I don't even know if they were 40Bs or not. But the 40Bs were a multiple month, and I'm, I'm, I'm using that as a reference because it was multiple meetings, multiple months, a year or so, a um, lot of meetings, a lot of stuff. Um, they voted at the last meeting three to two to, to turn down the detox center. Now they're going to have a meeting, I think the 27th, right. yeah. to sign that document. Because what they did in between. That's the 13th. Right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because it was forwarded to me the other day by a member and asked, what, then I'll, they, they asked me if they're, they're opening th that again. No, they're not. They're not going to discuss the case at all on the 13th. Right. They, they're going to they're gonna sign. So what's going to happen on the 27th is the same thing. They're going to possibly possibly vote on this special uh, request and I say possibly because they could continue it okay they might not it might delay this even further because they might continue because there are as evidence tonight almost two hours of unanswered questions to the board of selectmen who have no authority to make the decision so everything that was brought up tonight should be brought up on the 27th, everything. We can't, we can't yeah. speak, it's a public meeting. That's the other thing, it's not a public hearing well, like Well, why is that? On the special accommodation? Yes, it's a public meeting. It's why? not even a public well, hearing, Eddie. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's not anything. And what, that's not right. And, and what will happen is that well, the town council will bring up its recommendation to the to the zoning board. Um, and I did something not that, that we can't really talk about uh, for, for strategy purposes or litigation purposes that that's not right in my opinion I, I I I don't mr. chairman I understand why I, I don't understand why um, the Board of Appeals meeting for the special accommodation is not a public hearing where people can like evidence of tonight mm -hmm. and, and now I am now I'm understanding why they're in front of us now I'm understanding more why they're in front of them. I'm thinking here, why, why, why are we listening to this when we, we don't have the authority? Now I understand why they're asking this question. We're all on the same page now. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense that, that the special accommodation part of that meeting is not public hearing, and we should look into that. I think the board should look into that and find out why between now and the 27th and get, a, get an answer from, legal, from town council. Not tonight. I'm not asking for opinion tonight but the people need to know the people need to know that okay thank you town council you can't answer that answer no that tonight? No. No. no 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 i wouldn't want them to i wouldn't want I, i'm not asking them to do that it's putting them on the spot and without does someone else wish to speak before we go to new business yes so i know trisha xavier 40 oakdale road I know that Mr. Loud, before you mentioned that that letter would be a great letter, that we should definitely um, have it read into the record. But now we're hearing that we might not be able to read it into the record. I'm wondering then it would make sense if Mr. Loud was on that board 
and said that it should definitely be read into the record. Can we at least have it being read into the record tonight? Because we're not sure if it's going to be able to be read. And a couple of people mentioned that letter and that it was important. Was this the letter of January 22nd? I believe so. From Jenny. Yep. But I just know that you mentioned that we should definitely read it at that meeting, and I was going to respect that request. I, I did not know that it was not. But if we can't, hearing. and okay. he's been on both boards, I think that's a good suggestion. Jeff, if you want to, I can read it. All right. Well, yes. Just kind of for clarification, every piece of communication that's referenced by the town manager and that's included on the agenda is part of, of the record, record of the meeting. Right. It is already incorporated into the record of the meeting. Right. Um, the, the concept of being read into the record um, is it, it, the, the, the minutes of the meeting are not a transcript of the meeting, and it's not necessary uh, for, the, for a letter to be read into the record for it to be included as part of the minutes and to be incorporated into this meeting's record. So it already is. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Are you now uh, putting all of the communications that are in your packets, are they part of the uh, agenda that gets published on the town's website prior to this meeting? I had thought that, that maybe you had made that decision to go in that direction. No, no, no. Sorry? We haven't gotten there yet. I think yeah. I gave a, a, a yeah. clarif yeah. clarifying question to the, the woman in back. Uh, was it the, the letter uh, Jenny from Chavon. Jenny uh, Chavonier? Yes. Okay. Just because okay. I know yeah, that, that was, Ed, Mr. Lowry had suggested we read it there. It was at least addressed to the um, Zoning Board of Appeals, so I would presume that, that would be at, the, at a bare minimum a part of the record. Right. Just I'm just concerned that some people can't attend those meetings, especially elderly people, and might not be able to access even if it is on a website. But a lot of them I know can access things on the website, but they might be able to, someone might share a video piece with them. I know definitely people use that for a communication. So I was just hoping um, that that record, that could be read so people could be aware of it. Thank you. Actually, I, I know that she spoke about it, and you just did. It, it's interesting you said that you get your packets on Friday. Um, I went to town hall this morning and requested a couple of the letters that were going to be, um, that were on the agenda for today, and I was very specifically told by the town clerk that you do not get the letters until the meeting, and that um, the public does not have access to them until tomorrow. And I very specifically said, well, that's strange because I'm asking for letters that are going to be talked about in part of the meeting tonight. And I, and I was told that you didn't have them yet and that the public couldn't have them until the day after the meeting. Is that not true? It's news to me. Yeah, well, yeah. If you, if well, you we get them Friday night. night. Yeah. I, I know well, before the Monday meeting. meeting. If, if you're wondering why the police show up at my house every other Friday night, it's, <laughs> it's, it's for this. I promise. So I know you're, you, you had come into the office on Friday looking for this same information. And, you know, one of my, and it's a policy, uh, is that I uh, want to get information to the Board of Selectmen before the public sees it. So the public isn't querying the Board of Selectmen about information they don't have. So that was why... Um, the administrative assistant indicated on Friday that the information wasn't available. I'm not sure, quite frankly, why you would have been told today uh, that the Board of Selectmen had not received the information because, as was stated, they receive it on Friday evening. So, you know, I'll certainly make sure that that understanding is corrected. Um, I apologize for that. I'm not sure why that happened. Okay, is that it for public comments? Move on to uh, new business. Thank you. All right, new business. Um, Mr. Bendel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple quick things. I do have a, a couple comments and uh, two questions, if I may, and two uh, for the manager. If we could just get an update at a future meeting on the timeline in which we'll be putting together the Economic Development Committee. Uh, yes. That would be great. I know we mentioned and it was approved, but I'm just wondering, uh, it's getting awfully lonely on the committee by myself, so I'm, I'm eager to get some other people from the community uh, on board. So if we get that, that'd be great. Second question is uh, regarding the budget that we saw last week as I begin to go through it. Uh, the first question that I have is that uh, we asked for some specific uh, improvements to be made at the Senior Center. Could you maybe elaborate as to where those 
uh, line items will be listed? Is it public works? Uh, no, it's public, public buildings. buildings. It's the in the public buildings uh, uh, budget, um, as it, you know, any of these improvements are that are made to um, uh, buildings. Let me just uh, get the page. Into. So there's a line item uh, expenses town buildings and the line item appropriation is 210,000 so the money would be coming out of that line item. Thank you. And uh, I just uh, I want to uh, uh, commend uh, for the folks who put together a wonderful dedication uh, for our uh, former superintendent Joanne Benton. Yesterday was very well attended by uh, many members of the community. It was such a wonderful tribute. I thought the highlight of the, the tribute was the children uh, performing, uh, the singing, and the, also the members of the band and the strings. And it was just a wonderful, it was very moving, to be quite honest. Uh, and it was so wonderful to see such a great outpouring for such a wonderful woman. What a beautiful yeah. tribute uh, that will be going forward for our children to have that uh, named in her honor. Uh, I also want to uh, just voice my own personal opinion on the disappointment uh, that the, the way that the rink unfolded. I know we're going to hear maybe more specifics in a minute from the manager, which I requested him to do the minute that we found out uh, last week. And uh, awfully disappointing because it seemed like from 2014 on, it was a really uh, conscious effort by the entire community to pursue that. And it was really unfortunate to find out last week that uh, we will no longer have that opportunity. So I look forward to the details. I won't get into that further. But uh, certainly, I will want to be the first up here. It's been mentioned already, and I'm sure it'll be a common theme here throughout the rest of the night, but it's certainly deserving. I know it's getting late, but uh, I'm more than willing to stay up and make sure that we commend my good friend, uh, Mr. Loud. And I want to thank you. I see members of your family are here. Uh, some are in the hallway. And, uh, and I wish you well. I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for your volunteerism. I know that you and I haven't always agreed on every issue. But certainly, you've always remained civil. You've respected me, and you've shown me nothing but respect. So uh, for that, I, I am grateful. And I certainly wish you and your family all the best. It's been mentioned that this you will be a loss to the town. There's no doubt about it. So I wish you well. And uh, Wilmington will always be a home for you. We will always welcome. One last thing. If the Patriots play in Baltimore next year, you're going to get a lot of calls from folks in Wilmington <laughs> right. to be put up, OK? So I'll be one of them. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I go to Mr. McCoy, I want to uh, have uh, Mr. Hull addressed the rink yes. issue? Uh, so just um, for overview purposes, the initial discussion uh, about the rink uh, that took place in uh, 2014, or uh, early part of 2014. Uh, there were some discussions uh, with uh, Mr. Restusha, uh, myself, and uh, then Selectman uh, uh, Mr. Newhouse, uh, Mike Newhouse, and uh, there, uh, there seemed to be an indication uh, by Mr. Restusha that he would be uh, interested in selling the property uh, to the town. Um, again, there was no formal negotiation, but there was an expression of interest, and uh, the uh, uh, amount uh, was talked about as a potential. Again, that nothing, uh, no commitment, uh, formal commitment was $2,250,000. And as many of you will recall, uh, we went to town meeting uh, in uh, December of 14 uh, to seek authorization to uh, raise an appropriate or borrow that amount of money. Uh, in uh, in the meantime, uh, <clears throat> the lease that uh, Mr. Restusha had with Robert Rotundo uh, was for uh, was due to expire in uh, 2015. Uh, I believe it was June or July thereabouts. Uh, <clears throat> so during uh, the course of 2015. Um, uh, Mr. Restusha, and I'm not sure what the impetus was to do this, but he ultimately decided to extend uh, the lease uh, from 2015 to 2018. Uh, and 
Uh, then in the spring of 2015, um, Mr. Restucia, uh, Mr. Rotundo uh, filed suit against Mr. Uh, Restucia, alleging that uh, the town and uh, Mr. Restucia had engaged in conversations or, or formal negotiations, I guess, about uh, the purchase of the rink, and he claimed that he had a right of first refusal in his lease. Uh, so he uh, wound up taking Mr. Restucia to court, and as a consequence, uh, the town was really locked out, if you will. We could not, you know, the expectation at that point was we were going to wait until the lease expired uh, in June or thereabouts of 15, and then engage in formal discussions with uh, Mr. Restucia. Unfortunately, when the uh, extension uh, was signed off on that, created a, an issue there, and then ultimately when uh, this suit was filed, uh, that further uh, prohibited or inhibited the town from engaging in any formal conversations with Mr. Restucia about purchasing the rink. So uh, the, uh, the uh, efforts between the two parties are really what, as I understand it, there was not a lot of uh, discussion during the intervening period between 2015 in 2018, um, but ultimately in 2018, as the suit was due to be heard in court, uh, there was uh, apparently some discussions uh, between Mr. Restucia and Mr. Rotundo uh, to resolve the issue. Uh, at the time, and we were uh, monitoring the situation, our uh, former counsel uh, had discussions with um, representatives from Mr. Restucia and Mr. Rotundo um, looking to try to uh, address ice time and the price of ice time. But because we were not a party uh, to the contract or the lease, we really didn't have any leverage uh, to make any demands. So ultimately, the two parties reached a settlement, which as I understand it, and I've not seen the lease, but I'm told uh, that it was for an extension uh, of five years on the lease between Mr. Restucia and Mr. Rotundo. Uh, so that took place in, uh, um, I believe it was May or June of uh, 2018. Uh, and then th there haven't been any discussions uh, between the town and Mr. Restucia since that time. Uh, and then it was just this past week uh, that I became aware of the sale of the rink. Uh, actually, Selectman Bendel um, uh, contacted me and apparently had, be, had been uh, posted on social media. Um, we confirmed that, in fact, it was uh, sold. Um, but that's really uh, the extent of it. There, it, it's, you know, uh, ultimately you have two parties here that, um, that decided to uh, pursue, a, pursue a transaction. The town had no uh, ability legally to intervene in that process. Um, we did not have any right of first refusal because we didn't have any legal document with Mr. Restucia. He's a private property owner, uh, just like anyone who owns a home. You know, he opted to sell to, uh, to someone, uh, in this case, uh, this um, uh, gentleman from Concord, as I understand it. So. That's really uh, where we are today. Thank you. Mr. McCord. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad, I mean, obviously it lit up like fire on Facebook relative to this. I'm glad Mr. Bendel did talk to the manager. And I and I think everyone was gonna bring that up. And I'm glad the town manager put it in perspective. And just a little bit more history on it. I served on the planner board, 84 to 87. And if you know where the Sonic is, that was a car dealership. And I remember the Mr. Restuccia, when it used to be the Big W, he'd advertise in the Herald Record uh, on the back page. I worked at Big Joe's, he had tons of people coming off the train and they would, where's the Big W? Down the street, and that's where they could buy cars. So he, was, he did a great job. And I remember him pulling up in his 1967 Shelby with Mr. Baseball, Kirk Gowdy. And everyone was there, members of the Board of Selectmen, members of the Planning Board were there, everybody was there and it sounded like a great time. And the bottom line is uh, it just seems like it was just nothing but broken promises how the town was going to benefit by this. And I agree with uh, 
<coughs> Selectman Shampoo and Judy O'Connell hit the nail on the head as well. Her comments, your comments, all the four members, other than myself, the four members, we all took care. We all got up at the town meeting. But I did say at that town meeting back, was it 2015 or 16? 14. 14. 2014. We all got up and said we need to make take a wrong and make it a right. But I did get up at that town meeting and state. Just want to let everybody know, three weeks ago, Mr. Restuccia signs a deal with uh, Rotundo. And uh, that's what I think ended up ruining the whole thing. And it was just a lot of good talk about it. But it's really sad that we had an opportunity to do something with it. And it's not our fault. What you said is 100% correct. And every single member on that board, including uh, former selectman, Shampoo, O'Connell, Lucy Magli, and Mike Newhouse, we really cared. We really wanted to do something. And unfortunately, he just seems like he was just a used car salesman using us to probably get a better deal elsewhere. It's really sad. Thank you. Mr. E oh, I'm sorry. Oh. One more thing. Yeah. Eddie, I want to say, everyone's going, I want to say you're a stand-up guy. I respect you. I respect your family. And I'm really glad to see that this is going to work out for you and obviously it's going to benefit your family and I wish you nothing but the best and I will say one thing I do admire under new business you always gave a shuttle to the vets that really meant a lot and that says a lot about your character and you do care about the town and I just wish you nothing but the best and uh, I, hope I that think continues, Mike. yeah and thank I'll you. say that in a few minutes yeah just thank, thank you, you. Thank uh, you. just um, mostly echoing um, comments made by uh, Selectman Bendel and, and Selectman McCoy it does feel uh, and again, it, because there was no communication, it really just is a situation that lends itself to us guessing as to what happened. But it does have the feel that like, uh, the interest that our community expressed in, in purchasing that rink was um, used as leverage to drive up the price. And I, I think that's, that's it's really frustrating because I know an awful lot of work went into trying to make that happen. Uh, I, I know. Uh, that Mr. Hull and, and his staff put together an awful lot of research. And Mr. Hull, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not in the business of acquiring and running hockey rinks. And you had done an enormous amount of homework projecting revenue and expenses to make sure that this is a uh, revenue neutral or near revenue neutral investment for the community. So it, it made fiscal sense. There's certainly the community need for it. Uh, and to, to have this uh, happen is um, it's, it's really frustrating. Um, I uh, like I select from Bendel, select from McCoy, select from Kyra. I know uh, Mr. Loud, you were um, setting up uh, down in, in uh, Baltimore or Maryland, um, and Mr. Hall, you were there as well. But that uh, ceremony for uh, Miss Benton last night or yesterday was absolutely fantastic, um, and to when, when the curtain goes up, if you haven't seen it, you, I'm sh I know WCTV at least put a portion of it uh, online, but it's worth a watch. When the curtain goes up and, and the high school kids are there and they start singing uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow and then It's a Wonderful World, it got real dusty in there real quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a, a, an amazing public servant who dedicated so much of her time and energy to the kids in Wilmington. And... Um, I thought it was just such a, a wonderful tribute to her. So um, I'm glad that that's going to live on uh, in her name. Ed? Hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I really only met you about a year ago. Uh, you are one of the most authentic individuals I've ever met. Um, I don't think I've ever had a personal conversation with you where you haven't gushed about your family and your kids. Uh, it has been... <laughs> it was... As somebody who was new coming onto this board, it was fantastic that the guy I, I sat next to was just salt of the earth, a good guy, worked really hard, uh, and cares an awful lot about this community. So um, please don't be a stranger. I know you're going to be spending 90% of your time in, in Maryland, but um, you know the 10% of the time that, that you're here, uh, we're going to be appreciating it. You've been a... Uh, a very huge asset in this board. All, all matters related to zoning, your wealth of knowledge, you're a good guy, uh, and uh, we're going to miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Um, just um, have to, uh, my colleagues uh, said it all, um, and I would uh, just echo their comments. Uh, I, uh, regarding the rink, uh, I found out about it on February 9th. Uh, with a phone call 
uh, as well as I'm sure everybody else did. It's a shame that uh, Mr. Restucia uh, did what he did to the uh, uh, youth of, of Wilmington. It's just, uh, but as um, Mr. Hull said, it was a business transaction. Um, yesterday, uh, Joanne Benton's uh, time, uh, the tribute that, that was put on at Wilmington High School was amazing. Um, as Mr. Eaton said, uh, it probably wasn't a dry eye, so I was happy that the lights were real low <laughs> uh, when they played Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And, uh, it was just a phenomenal tribute uh, to a wonderful lady uh, who's uh, missed by all. Uh, Ed, I don't, I don't know if I can add on to what everybody said. Um, you are uh, just a, a phenomenal person to this board. Uh, you did a, you've done a yeoman's amount of work uh, when you're on the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, coming on as uh, a selectman. You always, you always spoke your mind. Uh, you always did it on behalf of the residents. Um, you always put the best foot forward. Um, I just uh, can't say enough uh, thank, you. Uh, thank yous to you and um, I'm happy for you and your family uh, that uh, you got uh, something that uh, is well deserved. It's too bad it's down in Maryland and it's not here in Massachusetts so you can stay on the board and uh, keep going here. Uh, but um, you, you, you really do care about the community and it shows uh, every single day um, and uh, you will be missed uh, on this board I want to thank you for everything that you've done um, in, in supporting this community uh, and volunteering your time uh, I want to thank your family as well uh, for them giving you to us uh, for all these many years uh, so congratulations and good luck and as everybody said I'm sure um, I'll be you'll be around yeah. Well, thank you all for the kind words. Um, I don't. I wrote notes down. I didn't write a speech because if I did, I'd be here for a long time. But um, I just want to reiterate: this job came to me late October. I called it a dream job. It is a dream job. Um, it happens to be in Baltimore. It's for a Caterpillar dealer down there. In my line of work, I buy and, and sell and rent generators all over the world and I get to go down there to do that for the dealership down there. Uh, they came to me in October. Um, I um, think I told Kevin in November, the chairman, and I, I, like I said, the last meeting I made his knees buckles and he doesn't have good knees. So um, we talked about it several ways for me to try to make it work down there. I actually start the job next Monday because uh, my little heart incident that I had in December that slowed things process down. But the good thing is they still wanted me down there. And no, I'm not going to become a Ravens or Orioles fan or Washington Redskins or Capitals or Wizards fans because they're all going to be playing in my territory, my new territory. Me and my uh, wife and um, talked about it over, over, over and over. She is going to stay here, so she's crazy enough to let me go down there for the first few months maybe even longer because we need to get our home situated. I'm still going to live and own Full Valley Lane. Um, so I'm going to be around. I'm actually coming home after my first week for a family function. And then a couple weeks later, the, I get committed to uh, trivia night for the band. So I'll be there with, the, with some friends and kicking Mike Shampoo's team's ass. <laughs> um, so, so I'm going to be around. I'm going to be at town meeting. I'm going to I'm going to vote at town election, so I'm still going to res reside at uh, Full Valley Lane where I, I am now. I'm just going to be spending a lot of time, 90, 95 percent of my time in Baltimore and traveling. I've got some travel scheduled. Um, so that's how the job came about, and I, I can't wait to get started. Um, tonight is a, was a big night for me, as you see my my wife's here, which this is the only select meeting she's ever been to since I've been on, so you can tell how much she loves the politics that's involved. Um, so um, she's here tonight in support of me.
we, we've been we've been married for 33 years and dating for a couple three years before that. So um, she's been behind me 100, 1,000 percent. We even moved to Vermont for a brief period of time because of a job. Uh, we came back pretty quick because it wasn't the right situation. Um, so she and then um, my son Eddie Jr. and Brianna are here. My daughter Emily, my youngest, my baby is at Becker College. She's a junior. She's uh, wishes she, she was here, but she's not. And the best grandmother, mother-in-law, and great-grandmother Marilyn Cox is here. Uh, we've lived with her for I don't know 30 something years since we've been in Wilmington. So we have an addition. We put an addition on the house. So Grandma Cox has uh, been part of it. My sister-in-law Lynn is here. My very best friend Doug Moore, who was a very much a supporter of my campaign and his wife Kat probably did most of the work not him can't give him credit and Mrs. Kaisinger and Mr. Woods and Mr. Shampoo and Lucy Maglier and Judy and Mr. Newhouse and Kevin and Greg and Mike and Jonathan Bevan and, and Jeff you guys have been great this board is a volunteer board I need to stress that it's not just every other Tuesday Monday night or twice a month it's like yesterday, the Joan Benton event. It's a lot of community events. Right now is the budget season, as I call it, the budget season, and all the FinCon meetings. These guys, most of these guys go to one or two or all of them. And I know I did, and I learned a lot. So this board is um, very special to me. Mr. Shampoo was the chairman when I came on. Uh, we were lucky enough to get Jonathan, who has taught me a lot. Um, That's a lot. No, it's not, that's not a lie about the finance and, and all this. And um, I enjoyed coming in every Wednesday, uh, signing the town warrants. It's, you, we get to sign the town warrants every Wednesday and ch chatting with Bev and, and Wendy and Jackie before that and just getting to know and, and coming around town hall and, and seeing everyone. It was, it was a lot of fun. So this decision to take this job wasn't easy for me. This was one of the toughest part because I had 1,849 people that voted for me. I had a lot of signs out there. I had a lot of people that were behind me. Um, and I really appreciate everyone there. And, and I do love this town. I love this town. I always will. And um, I will forever. So um, I just need to say thank you to everyone, everyone on this board, Greg and Mike and Kevin and Jeff and Jonathan and Beverly. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. You guys mean a lot to me. And I will, when I'm in town, I am going to come and say hi. I promise you, whether I'm sitting over there or on, a, on a, during the day. So thank you all. Thanks for the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Important dates, Mr. Hope. Uh, we have February 12th, Finance Committee meeting, uh, room 9, 7 p.m. We'll be talking about the public works and public buildings <coughs> budgets. February 14th, Finance Committee meeting, uh, Town Clerk, Board of Health, and Veterans. February 21st, uh, Finance Committee meeting, room 9, 7 p.m., Historical Commission Information Technology. Uh, Board of Selectmen meeting on February 25th, room 9, 7 p.m., February 26th, Finance Committee meeting, room 9, 7 p.m., Police, uh, Public Dispatch and Fire. Uh, February 28th, Finance Committee, uh, High School, room 1-062, 7 p.m., uh, discussing the Wilmington Public Schools budget. March 5th, Finance Committee meeting, Shawshine Tech, 7 p.m., uh, discussing the Shawshine Tech budget. And then March 7th, Finance Committee meeting, uh, Memorial Library, 7 p.m., Elderly Services and Library. Uh, March 11th, Board of Selectmen's meeting, room 9, 7 p.m. March 19th is the Finance Committee slash Planning Board uh, joint public hearing relative to the warrant for the annual town meeting. Uh, that'll be in the town auditorium at 7 p.m. And just a reminder that uh, May 5th, again, is the uh, plastic bag ban uh, will be in effect. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Good night.